Thomas Paine, Thomas Paine, Thomas Paine, Sam Adams, Sam Adams, Sam Adams, Benjamin Franklin, Benjamin Franklin, Benjamin Franklin. These men spoke up for what they thought was right. From their courage came such documents as the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States. United States. From their willingness to speak what was sometimes unpopular but right, we enjoy such liberties as freedom of speech, the right to keep and bear arms, and freedom of religion. There are those who still wish to oppress our freedoms, and there are still patriots willing to stand up and defend life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Men like Zed Bell who honor our founding fathers and what they stood for. It's now time for Zeb at the Ranch, speaking up and defending your freedoms. Brought to you by Magic Valley Les Schwab Tire Centers and all of the other great advertisers on the program. And now, Zeb Bell. I love this one. Here is a sign out in front of a place called Shipley's Donuts. Your name is not Calvin Klein. You are not an underwear model. If you want service here, pull your pants up. <laughs> I love it. Morning, everybody. Here comes Kate Smith, and God bless America. Followed by a patriot with our Pledge of Allegiance. Good morning. Oh, I love that song. Thank you very much, Kate Smith, and God bless America. Good morning to you on this Tuesday, May 2nd. And right now, without further ado, let's go and tell you about this is Zeb at the Ranch. I'm Zeb Bell with our major sponsor, your Magic Valley Les Schwab Tire Centers, all seven locations serving you, along with some of our great advertisers like Western Way Services, always at your disposal. Call, get on the route service, 734 734- Six nine six nine. Let's go to the phone line and have our Pledge of Allegiance. Good morning. Well, good morning, sir. There you are, Buckwheat. Go ahead. Yes, sir. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Thank you very much, Wheels. And right now, let's go to the weather forecast. Ramsey Heating and Electric and Lennox offering qualified rebates up to $1,700 on their home comfort systems. You better check it out. Call Ramsey Heating and Electric at 678-0459. Ramsey Heating and Electric and Lennox saving you money. Here's the weather. Today it's going to be a little bit on the windy side, but as we make our way towards the weekend, it's going to feel a little bit like summer. Mostly sunny skies for today. Winds out of the west right around 18 miles an hour. We are expecting a high of 63. Tonight, low of 39. Tomorrow, mostly sunny skies. High of 71 with an overnight low of 42. Thursday. Oh, Thursday's going to be nice. Sunny skies, high of 79. Overnight low of 50 for Friday, even better. Mostly sunny skies, high of 83 with an overnight low of 53. Then for Saturday, a few clouds will be rolling in. Partly cloudy skies, high of 76. That is your weather for Zebeth the Ranch. I appreciate it, Gina. Thank you. Sound in good. Really appreciate that. Hey, don't forget the Burley Livestock Sale Yard with a big sale. Big sale on Thursday this week. Absolutely the sale that works for you. Burley Livestock Sale Yard, 1100 Occidental Avenue in Burley, 6789411. Merv May, Cade, Roggy, Lance, Udy, all of those folks working for you. Call for consignment. Six seven eight nine four one one. Burley Livestock Sale Yard sale on Thursday at eleven a.m. Don't forget too, if you need your clothes cleaned, you're standing around in rumply crumplies, and you look at your closet and you're going, "I haven't got anything else to wear." Well, you better take your clothes into Daryl's Cleaners. By the way, too, a lot of people don't know that they will wash your clothes too. They've they've got the capability of washing your clothes. You've been going here, there, and everywhere, and you looked at the pile over in the corner and you go holy cow i don't have any clean socks well i'll tell you what take all your clothes right down there and get them cleaned at daryl's cleaners 1223 albion avenue in burley really really nice people serving you We've got a busy program this morning and i want to highlight some of the people that are going to be on this morning 
At 9.06, we've got uh, Kaya Mendelbaum uh, from the legal, uh, let's see, he's a legal counselor with the Energy and Environmental Legal Institute, and we're going to be talking about the revamping of some of the EPA policies. And at 9.30, right here in our studio, we're expecting him to drive in in about an hour from now, right, as a matter of fact. Lieutenant Governor Brad Little is going to be here this morning. And then at uh, 10.06, we've got Dr. His peddling his car into our driveway at 10.06. And then we're going to talk about veterans and jobs at 10.30 with Cliff Soseman. So that's our schedule for this morning. I want to remind you, too, about Ramsey Heating and Electric at uh, 611 Overland in Burley and also 291 Pole Line Road in Twin Falls. And it is by no small step that they have become known as America's Diner. What a great place to go for breakfast. What a great place to go anytime, all the time, if you're hungry. And check out all the list of that brand new line of burgers that they've got over there at Denny's Restaurant. Mmm, mmm, delicious. Denny's Restaurant, 611 North Overland in Burley, the home of Zeb's Lunch Bunch. You stop in and see them today. Also, some other folks that we really want to say thank you to that have been with us on this program ever since the start years and years ago. And that's Ramsey Heating and Electric at 2600 Overland Avenue in Burley. Number to call, 678-0459 for all your heating, cooling, and electrical needs. Don't shop around here and then run over there and then have to go back over there. You can get it all at one place. They've been serving you for over a half a century. Wow. Ramsey Heating and Electric at 2600 Overland Avenue in Burley, where they provide warm winters and cool summers. I have a question, and, you know, I'm, I, a lot of people say, well, you're nitpicking. No, no, I'm not. I'm very concerned. Twin Falls, for some reason, is just heck-bent on creating new verbiage that says, we're a welcome city. But there was a story on the op-ed page Sunday in the Times News. I commented briefly about this yesterday. And in the story... They said the following, and this is the uh, Twin Falls City Council, I believe, uh, writing this op-ed. What we do now will create the Twin Falls for our children and grandchildren. We're building a new west. Right there, I was chilled a little bit. Oh, I see Twin Falls is going to fashion a new West. Really? How is that new West going to be? I can't wait to hear the book and the bylines of what they're going to do. Who is going to dictate what or how this New West will be. And when you look at the liberal thought that's been going on across the country with the sanctuary cities and the crime rates and the illegal aliens and the refugee problems, is it going to be like the state of Minnesota? Is it going to be like Bill de Blasio's New York City or Rahm Emanuel's Chicago? Are we going to have sanctuary cities that criminals dictate to the taxpayers what's going to happen or not going to happen? Is You know, I'm really curious about what they meant in that phraseology. New West. And I'm a little bit more than concerned about what they're looking at. And why? Why they even need the words... Twin Falls is a welcoming city. All cities are welcoming cities, I would think, for legal happenings, legal citizens, legal business. And to say that they want something a little special, I'm glad to see that a couple of people, a couple of people on the Twin Falls City Council have said it's not necessary. It's not necessary to do this or waste time on this. But for some reason, the Twin Falls City Council and their illustrious mayor, Sean Berger, they want to build 
a new West. What does that mean to you? Give me a call, 436-2244-1-866-927-4587. Give me a call. Barry Equipment and Rental, I'm really honored and pleased to have them on our show for a long time. Barry Equipment and Rental, sales, service, and parts, and three locations to serve you, South Lincoln and Jerome, Addison Avenue West and Twin. And, of course, the big place, 159 West Highway 30 in Burley. You know, they've got all the equipment rentals, and they've got all the retail equipment sales, and they've got those very, I should say, they've got those Walker lawnmowers. If you're not familiar with those Walker lawnmowers, you should be, because, boy, these dudes can cut the grass. <laughs> you can just leave your place, go to the neighbors, and do the whole street. They are something else. Use what the pros do, those Walker mowers. Zero percent for 48 months. My, my, my. Like I said, Barry Equipment and Rental has all the equipment to get the job done right. Jerome, Twin Falls, and 159 West Highway 30 in Burley. Caller, I'll be right there. Don't go away. Uh, pardon me for the gravelly throat this morning and a little bit of a cough, but old hay fever's got a hold of me this morning. Burley Physical Therapy and Rehabilitation, 1263 Bennett Avenue, Suite 2 in Burley. They can and will and have done for me and can do for you, help you get back to being you. I know there's a lot of you been out doing a lot of spring yard work, and man, oh man, you got aches and pains where you didn't even thought you had places. Well, they can help you get back to being you excellent excellent physical therapist and they've got that hydrotherapy pool oh baby you better call 678-1191 678-1191 and make an appointment burley physical therapy and rehabilitation they're waiting to serve you caller good morning good morning hi you know i like the twin falls that i've known since i was a, a tot yep and I don't see any reason to change it now. I think that they got a little boost for national publicity by having the Chobani um, factory featured on a special. I can't even remember which, which network. But and, and I think that Americans are welcoming. But what's wrong with legal people coming and people who want to be Americans from the minute they touch their toe on the beach. There's there's no reason to bring people here who don't even have any idea where they're going. Chris, can you honestly tell me, and I, I, I think you're going to be on my side on this, can you honestly tell me that America today, right now today, is still the melting pot of all the world trying to come here in a legal fashion and assimilate as Americans in their new home country and stand with tears in their eyes looking up at that flag. I don't see it, and I'm scared that that's not the case today. I, I don't either, and, and I know for a fact because um, my husband's family immigrated to the United States all legally, and they were so thankful to be here that they learned the language on the boat on the way over here, and they and they didn't come without uh, documentation and permission. And I I think that that you know when you work a little harder to be become a a legal American, and then you get right on becoming familiar with all of our laws and everything, then you really are committed. But I I just don't feel the way... I think so many of them have a mission to do mayhem before they even get here. You know, there was a comment made yesterday, and I don't know if you caught it or not, but there was a comment that was made during the CBS News, I think at the 9 o'clock hour, and they were interviewing one of those millennials that was involved in the uh, riots and the the Molotov cocktail throwing and everything in Chicago and, and Portland, one of the people from one of the locations. And this kid made a comment. He said, everybody should come here to America. They all 
They all have the right to live the American dream. I don't know about you, but no, that's not the way it should be. I don't want everybody coming to America. I don't want it to become a cesspool of people, good, bad, ugly, whatever, like a Clint Eastwood movie. I don't want to have to figure out how we're going to support them. I don't want to have to figure out how we're going to house and feed them. I don't want to know about all the uh, welfare packages we've got to grow and pay for to take care of them. This is the kind of comment that infuriates me. Well, I'm afraid that we have an awfully lot of young kids, high school age and, and early college age, that are still so green behind the ears that they have not had to get out and compete with somebody who does not have the abilities that they do, and the other guy gets their job. Yeah. They are not having to move into a neighborhood that they've never even been in before, and all of a sudden, the neighborhood doesn't look quite like what they had expected. Yeah. And I'm not prejudiced. I, I really do love people because I've had kids from all over the world stay in my home, and, and my husband's family immigrated from Japan to get away from the war. But they came here on the boat. They were learning all the things that they needed to become good Americans. And don't kid yourself, they had the language pretty well under control, too, by, they, by then. But it, it's not like any of those people, well, a lot of them that are immigrating here, want to be Americans. But how do you, how do you just open up the floodgates and let them all come in? Well, my question is, my question is this then, going back to that op-ed piece in the Times News, uh, the, we're building a new West. Would you please go back to the original thought this morning, real quick, I've only got a minute left, and explain to me what's wrong with the old West? What's wrong with the West today with its values and family values and its heritage and tough people living through tough times and working hard to make something of themselves? What is this about building a new West? Um, I don't know. I kind of like the West the way it is. And uh, we've got a lot of diversity in, in our area, but everybody has taken the time to acclimate and become loyal and uh, hardworking, and they have higher values. I, I think that people on the East Coast may see the West as something that needs to be changed. Well, and I don't know that we want to be like the East Coast. I agree with you, and I think that's the bottom line, that they want a change. Here's what I see. I see a real danger in all these diverse cultures. I see a real danger in all these people coming in from various points of the compass. I see a real danger in not assimilating to our values and our heritage and saluting our flag and our country in honor of what people have died for, for the freedoms in this country. I see a real danger. And you know what? I am really afraid that our kids, our own kids are not being taught this in the schools so that they can also realize what really we have handed down generation to generation to keep and preserve this being the best country in the world. Well, that's, I think the school system has a lot to do with it. And that is, but as parents, we need to be teaching our kids at home too. I agree. I help my kids with their schoolwork all the way through school. And when you help your kids with their schoolwork, you ingrain your your principles. I agree. Chris, i got to run, but thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Calls welcome, 436-2244-1866-927-4587. Ag Express is looking for drivers. That's right. Retired folks are welcome. Full and part-time positions. I'm telling you, they'll really work around your schedule. They're looking for drivers. And you can drive two or three days a week or whatever works best for you. And you're home every night. They've got great vacations plans. They've got super benefit programs. All you have to do is call Dale and Paul at 438-8886, Allen and Twin Falls at 731-2495, or Russ and Burley at 431-7175. Ag Express is looking for drivers. Ag Express is looking for you. All right, give them a call.
By the way, too, don't forget, if you're noticing maybe a little diminishment in your hearing, I urge you, really urge you, I did, I did, a couple of years ago, got a hold of uh, Dr. Christine Pickup over at Mount Harrison Audiology and Hearing Aids, and she helped me, she can help you, and it's not old age that brings on the lesser hearing, it could be something related to your medicine, it could be something related to your health as far as a disease or whatever, many Many, many, many things that they can take a look at and help you with. Call 312-0957. And they're located right across from the Minidoka Hospital Emergency Room, Mount Harrison Audiology and Hearing Aids. You give them a call today. All right, calls are welcome, 436-2244-1-866-927-4587. <clears throat> One of the things that I'm really upset about this morning, and you should be too, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, about this Muslim woman, Linda Sarsour. Remember that name. You're going to be hearing a lot more about it. She had been contracted to do the commencement exercise speech at uh, the city of New York University. And she is a strong advocate of implementing Sharia law, Islamic Sharia law here in this country. She hates Israel and the Jewish people. And she said of many of the Jewish people, they were a waste of a body. She speaks to our college students at the city of New York University And at the same time, we're sitting here scratching our head. Why can't conservative and colder speak about family values, political values, and the values of America at Berkeley? And then these lame liberals come out and say, oh, no, we can't have Ann Coulter speak because finally, after all their balderdash of making excuses and canceling her contract last Thursday, April 27th, they said, well, we had to cancel the speech because of the safety of the students. We have a known terrorist lover. Linda Sarsour, Muslim woman that advocates Sharia law, hates Israel, and she can speak in New York, in the Big Apple, and twist and turn the minds of our young people, but Ann Colder cannot speak in Berkeley because these perverted sickos that supposedly are the college heads said it might not be good for student safety. Would you please explain this to me? That on the one hand, we'll let the left loons come in and spread their hate and spread their absolutely demise to America. And on the other hand, someone that's conservative with values for this country, they can't speak. Give me a call, 436-2244-1-866-927-4587. Come on, somebody break the ice and give me a call. I want to hear from you. (coughs) Besides that, I got a little bit of a sore throat, so you can help me out this morning. Uh, Don't forget to our friends at Lennox. I'd like to remind you that, oh my goodness, along with Ramsey Heating and Electric, they're all teamed up to offer you up to seventeen hundred dollars in rebates oh my goodness uh, on all the gas furnaces air conditioners heat pumps on qualified lennox home comfort systems all you have to do is call ramsey's at six seven eight zero four five nine ramsey heating and electric and lennox saving you money all right callers don't be uh, don't be chicken Give me a call, 436-2244-1-866-927-4587. How many of you saw that newscast last night where they were saying, now picture this, how many of you do this with your right hand? Uh, Leave your left hand on the wheel if you're driving, please. Make the okay sign. 
Is everything all right? Hey, I'm okay. I've done that a gazillion times probably in my life. That may be a mild exaggeration, but I've gone, okay, yeah, we're right. Now, now, the left is so pitiful. They are coming out and said last night that if you give the okay sign to someone, you're actually, according to these left fruitcakes, giving a sign for white power and racism. I know. (laughs) You're like me. I had to scratch my head last night and say, what? What? Yeah, they said somehow they figured it out that with the OK sign, it's a W, and the P sign, WP, for white power. And they're raising all kinds of heck over anybody that would give the OK sign because that absolutely signifies white power. I'm telling you, there is not enough aspirin in the world to give to these left liberal loons to tell them to lay down, take an aspirin, and you'll feel better in the morning. They, I've never heard so much lunacy going on in our country and the world today. It's like the story that we covered yesterday. It was on the news last night. I was one of the first ones to hit it. That over in England, they don't want you to clap anymore at events where you clap and you might cheer a little bit. No, they don't want you to go, hey! No. They want you to use your hands in the air silently. Just kind of wave your hands. I'm doing it. Can't you hear it? Yeah, they call it jazz hands. And they want you to do that because some loon came out and said, well, by hand clapping and cheering you're actually segregating those that might be hearing impaired in the audience. They can't hear, and so there you're clapping and everything, and they, the hearing impaired, might think you're making fun of them. What? I'm telling you, you can look up every word in the dictionary for lunacy, craziness, liberal, whatever. And every one of these people is falling underneath those categories. My goodness, now you can't make the OK sign, in which I'm going to do this. At the next lunch bunch, I want all the lunch bunchers, when I get up in front on the count of three, everybody, how are you? We're OK. We're not going to change our ways for these left crazies. Come on, give me a call. 436-2244-1-866-927-4587. And uh, while I'm waiting for your call, I'll tell you a little bit about K&R Rental at 256 South, 600 West of Hayburn. They are open Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 5.30 p.m., Saturday 7 to 2. And they've got all the tools over there and all the equipment. If you don't want to buy them, by gully, go to K&R Rental and rent them. Mm-mm. And they'll deliver and pick up the power tools and heavy equipment at your site when you're all done. They've got everything over there. They've been in business since 1979. All you have to do is give them a call at 678-3122 or stop in at 256 South, 600 West of Hayburn, K&R Rental. Holy cow, I'm going to have to make an offer here this morning. I've never seen. the Wheels, what did you do to the phone line over there? I'm not exactly sure. I think everybody's just kind of having a... Wow. On a day when I've got a sore throat from the hay fever and everything, everybody just kind of left me on a deserted island, which I'm taking a cough drop in my mouth if you wanted to know what that noise was, and left me on a deserted island with sharks swimming around it. Come on, give me a call, 436-2244-1866-927-4587. Love to hear from you folks. Uh, Let's see, what else have I got in the news? Oh, Chelsea Clinton. i got to talk a little bit about Chelsea Clinton. What really has Chelsea Clinton ever done to gain so much notoriety and all these awards? We'll talk about that in a little bit. My goodness, you saved the day. Good morning, you're on the air. This is the Mounted Police. 
Oh, good. And we're here to rescue you. <laughs> well, uh, put your dog outside on the porch and come on in and have a cup of coffee. Okay, Sergeant Preston, what's going on? Where do I put my hat? Don't ask that question because I could tell you real easy if we were off the air. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this lunacy we're having, what can you say? What can you possibly say? that would be positive for these folks. They don't understand what liberty really is. Oh, they understand it, and they want to take it away. Uh, it's nothing more than the seven-letter word, word control. That's all these people want. But, Keith, I mean, no matter where you turn around every day, the OK sign, I would imagine that you have used that OK sign so many times in your life it's uncountable. And did you ever at one time think that when you were doing that, you were signifying to people that you're a racist and believe in white power? It is so ridiculous. And to not cheer for somebody who's done something phenomenal is just wrong. They're loons. These people are absolute loons. They have no business being allowed on the street after 6 o'clock at night or to play with sharp objects. They are loons. Well, what can you say about these people? I mean, they just... They're not of this world. Well, they're of this world, all right. No, they're of this world, my friend Keith, and the problem is they're increasing in numbers. They're like uh, potato chips. They keep making more of these loons. Yeah, you know, and if the parents plow into this just like the parents wanted to, they'll become just like them. Yeah. And then you've really got a problem. How did you, did you follow the protests that went on yesterday over May Day? Yes, and it is so disgusting because this is a celebration, I guess, of Labor Day, and these people turned it into a damn right. Well, they did, and there was looting, and there was burning, and there was Molotov cocktail throwing, and there was a bunch of these liberal loons all over. But now here's a question I've got for you. Did you know that uh, of the 25 people that were arrested in Portland, Oregon, and there were arrests all over this country, that of the 25, two were 17-year-olds, and a 14-year-old. My question to you is, Mr. Cottom, why weren't they in school, and what kind of parents and family do they have, and why aren't the parents held up on charges for child neglect and child abuse for letting their kids be out on the street with these loons? Well, when you've got these liberal judges, how can the parents do anything? I don't know, but I'm looking at 17-year-olds that should be in school, 14-year-old that should have been in school, and they were interfering with police, and they were throwing rocks, and they were throwing Molotov cocktails. What? What were you doing out at 14 years of age? Were you doing this kind of garbage? No, but on Halloween, we did some things that probably wouldn't be real proper, like over an outhouse. Well, let's just leave that conversation lie dormant for a little while, shall we? Thank you, Keith, for your call. Appreciate it. You bet. Bye-bye. All right. Take care. Calls are welcome. 436-2244-1-866-927-4587. I'm looking at the mug shots, honestly, of these loons up in Portland. And uh, there are three of which the photos were not available of the two 17-year-olds and the 14-year-old. They wouldn't publish those. There's not one of these people that I'm looking at. Ay, 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 pretty scary material here. And I doubt that any of them are over 30 years of age. And they're out there, and they had explosives, and they had Molotov cocktails, and they had rocks. And I would imagine that if you put and investigated and interrogated these people, why were you doing this? Well, we don't like Donald Trump. 
No, we're going to get him thrown out of office. Okay. Uh, why don't you like Donald Trump? What do you think's wrong with the world today? And ask them a bunch of questions. They're not smart enough to answer these questions. They have not got a clue. But yet, two 17-year-olds and a 14-year-old were out on the streets when they should have been in school and were arrested by police for throwing and demonstrating and injuring. Stupid. Calls welcome, 436-224-1-866-927-4587. Uh, real quick, I want to finish that story about Chelsea Clinton. <laughs> You talk about your wealthy that get and those that aren't, don't type things. Chelsea Clinton, she has uh, gained so much notoriety, and they've given her so many awards. Now, the latest, and I'm not making this up, folks. I checked it out thanks to my lovely bride on the computer. The latest award that she is getting is a huge humanitarian award, I believe, from Variety magazine. And they put her on the cover, and she's supposed to be, oh, Chelsea Clinton, my goodness sake, she might possibly run for political office, and she's been so great, and she's done so much, and she's such a humanitarian. She supposedly was on the board of directors, of a group that was going to pass out fruit to the poor and the homeless. She didn't really do a lot. The so-called grunts on the group, the ones that do all the work and the labor and the cleanup and the unboxing and the dishing out and the passing out and everything else, they really did all the work. But they were passing out grapefruit, to homeless people and poor people. Now, why they pick grapefruit is beyond me. I mean, oranges, I can understand. Apples, I can understand that too. But grapefruit? I mean, I love grapefruit, but grapefruit? And because she's part of this board that did this, oh, why, she's our focal piece. Yes, we'll put her up on the mantle. we got to give her this great big humanitarian award. For passing out grapefruit. Please help me. Give me a call, 436 2244 1866 927 4587. Well, I'm waiting for your call. Let's do the weather forecast. And the weather is sponsored by Riverview Urgent Care. And they're located at 382 North Overland and Burley, along with Twin Falls Urgent Care, 2392 Addison Avenue East in Twin, and Jerome Urgent Care, 133 West Avenue A in Jerome. Minor emergencies, major care. Oh, by the way, listen to this. This week, day after tomorrow, they're going to start with their sports physicals, a summer special, just $10 for those sports physicals, and 100% of that money is going to be donated back to your school's athletic program. So be sure and go to the Urgent Cares. Okay? Right now, here's Gina with the weather. Today it's going to be a little bit on the windy side, but as we make our way towards the weekend, it's going to feel a little bit like summer. Mostly sunny skies for today. Winds out of the west right around 18 miles an hour. We are expecting a high of 63. Tonight's low of 39. Tomorrow, mostly sunny skies. High of 71 with an overnight low of 42. Thursday. Oh, Thursday's going to be nice. Sunny skies. High of 79. Overnight low of 50 for Friday. Even better. Mostly sunny skies. High of 83 with an overnight low of 53. Then for Saturday, a few clouds will be rolling in. Partly cloudy skies. High of 76. That is your weather for Zeb at the Rain. I appreciate it, Gina. Thank you. Brought to you by the Urgent Cares. Riverview Urgent Care in Burley. Twin Falls Urgent Care. Twin Falls and Jerome Urgent Care in Jerome. Minor emergencies. Major care. Thank you very much. Randy was going to call in this morning, and he had a topic that we were going to discuss a little bit, and evidently he forgot. But calls are welcome at 436 224 Seven four five eight seven. Give me a call on the landline. We would love to talk to you. Uh, let's see what else have we got here cooking this morning on our program sheets. Um, 
The FDA tries to postpone putting calorie info on restaurant menus. What do you think about that? Do you want to go into a restaurant and enjoy a nice meal out? I mean, maybe you don't get the opportunity to really reach into your Wrangler jeans and pull out enough money to take your wife or your girlfriend and go out to eat a really nice meal. And you don't get a chance to splurge very often. And now you want to go in there and you really want to read the caloric content of every meal. I don't. Caller, good morning. You're on the air. Good morning, Zeb. Well, how are you? Good, good. First off, on the uh, deal with the menus, I don't give a darn what uh, the nutritional information is. I just want something that tastes good when I go to a restaurant. Well, if you're going to buy the meal, and today money is a little bit tight, and if you're going to splurge a little bit and enjoy, I absolutely agree with you. Go ahead. What's your second point? i got another call waiting. On the uh, protest deal, you know, if I'd have been, if I'd have tried to cut in school to protest or anything like that, when I was uh, a kid, like those kids were, I'd have had my high 10 for sure. Oh, I, I can't even imagine in my day what would have happened if I would have done something like that. When my dad came home from work that afternoon, it would have been life over as I knew it. It would not have occurred again. Oh, it would have been game over for me, too, for sure. All right. Hey, man, I appreciate your call. Thank you very much for your input. Catch you later. All right, buddy. Good morning, caller. You're on the air. Go ahead. Good morning, Zeb. Yes, sir. You know, uh, I kind of been in the program earlier this morning to talk about kids and patriotism and flight and everything. My little granddaughter graduated from Oak Hill this year. She stands about five foot tall. She came home a couple of weeks ago, stood about six foot tall, and she says, Guess what, Grandpa? She said, I passed the uh, citizenship test award. She was filled with pride and honor, and uh, it was rewarding to see that uh, the efforts that Adam Powell and, and uh, Senator Hampton put in is slowly taking effect. You know, now, George, uh, what about this citizenship test? What about other schools, other areas, other districts? Is this a movement, hopefully, that's going to grow with popularity? It should. Uh, the bill that uh, Senator Anthem got through last year, uh, two years ago in the legislature, that uh, all schools in Idaho does have to do the citizenship test and uh, flag education. Okay. And also on the... Uh, the Rupert Veterans Memorial Incorporated bought uh, U.S. Constitution books and flags books for all the schools, so they have to be taught now. Okay, what did you think, honestly, of the story that I was talking about a little earlier? But uh, I've got a picture of all the mugshots of these wet-nosed punks that were uh, protesting in Portland and burning and tossing uh, Molotov cocktails, and three of which were only 17 and 14. You know, I think they ought to haul the parents up on charges. Uh, accountability starts at home. You know, and, and I kind of, I got a little bit of sympathy for the kids. I don't respect a lot of these little kids today. But uh, they never had no bad up at home. You know, today we've got kids raising kids. And a lot of these uh, younger generations never had to do with it, like Vietnam or World War II or Korea. And so uh, they're ignorant, I guess, if that's a proper word to use, on the uh, what the flag of what United States stands for. Amen. George, I appreciate your uh, being on the air with us. Hey, real quick, and I mean real quick, George, because I've got to get some other things in here, but uh, the third annual Idaho Roll Call Memorial Ride and the program is going to be on May 27th, right? Yes. Yes, uh, we're, it's an open to the public. We'll have a short program. We'll be food. Uh, come up veterans will come in on their bikes. We're uh, working on to get some keynote speakers, and uh, all proceeds from it from uh, this goes to uh, get flag education in school. All right, George. God bless you, man. We'll be talking more about that next week. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. That man and his wife have done so much for our veterans.
and for the POW MIA program, and I just have the utmost respect for them. Calls are welcome. Come on, give me a jingle. 436-2244-1-866-927-4587. You know, a lot of folks, I wish that they look at their watches and say, oh, my goodness, we're almost at the end of the first hour, and then they call, and we can't give them much time, so I still got some time. Give me a jingle, and we'll get you in this morning. The uh, spending bill that Trump is looking at right now this morning and that the Republicans are trying to jam through, I don't know where they're coming from, but I don't like it. They're still going to fund Planned Parenthood. They're still going to fund with the monies to EPA. Wait a minute. I'm just shortening the list here a little bit this morning. But we were told, we were promised... We were basically coerced during the campaigns that Trump had said, I am going to do this, I am going to do that. But there is a fraction of the Republican Party that wants to keep the same old, same old. And to them, I point a finger of condemnation. Now, next week, we're going to have Senator Mike Crapo on the program. And then we're also working on Senator Jim Risch. Uh, Mike, of course, is on usually about every two weeks. But I don't pull punches with either of them. And I'm going to tell them, hey, you know, you need to form coalitions of power back there with other senators and get the job done that the people want. You've got control of the House. You've got control of the Senate. You've got the man in the Oval Office that you, uh, as a party have to support because he did represent the Republican Party. Now let's get something done for us. And enough of this internal bickering. They're like a bunch of doggone school kids arguing over somebody's snicker candy bar. It's about high time we were the focal point. We were the ones that said we don't want to fund Planned Parenthood anymore. We don't want to give all that money to the EPA. We want our voices heard. And unfortunately, that's not happening, even now, with all the control by the Republican Party. Maybe you're not upset about it, but I am. Calls welcome, 436-22-441-866-927-4587. Uh, The Magic Valley Les Schwab Tire Centers are telling you that they can help you get where you're going this summer on safe tires. I mean, the safest of tread designs, the safest of tires uh, for your pickup and your SUV and your cars. I mean, we're talking about tires like, oh, the Terramax HT for your pickups and SUVs. All-season tire, very economically priced. And they all, all the tires, I mean, they really know what's going to best suit your style of driving. So stop in and see them today. Seven locations. They've also got the best in brake service and, of course, the best in front end alignment, shocks and struts and batteries. But above all, like I said, service. They really are great. Lane and Rupert, Dave on Blue Lakes and Twin, Mike and Buell, Mike and Jerome, the Twist family in Paul, Daniel on Poline in Twin Falls, and Randy on Overland in Burley. Nobody better. Your Magic Valley, Les Schwab Tire Centers. You stop in and see them today. Uh, Let's see what else have I got here real quick. Oh, uh, Saturday is Russell Smith's birthday. Now, uh, for those of you that may not know, Russell Smith is going to be 92 years old this Saturday, and he is a three-time recipient of the Purple Heart Award for his absolute uh, courage and valor for our country. And he's now living up at the Idaho State Veterans Home, at 1957 Alvin Ricken Drive in Pocatello, room 70, room 70, and the uh, zip code 83201. So I really urge you to send this man, a hero for this country, 
for us. Uh, birthday well wish. And he's going to be 92 years old. He listens to this program on the Internet, zebbell.com. And uh, I just absolutely salute this man for all he's done. He's been on my program quite a few times in the past. And, of course, a former lunch muncher that used to come every month. And last month we had that great big birthday cake and a party and everything. So please send those to Russell Smith at the Idaho State Veterans Home. 1957 Alvin Ricken Drive, room 70 in Pocatello, 83201. I'd really appreciate that. All right, what we've got cooking for the rest of the morning. At 9.06, we're going to have uh, Kaya Mendelbaum on our program with the Environmental and Legal Institute. And then at 9.30, we're expecting Lieutenant Governor Brad Little to drive in the yard and come in the studio and visit with us. He's running for governor. And uh, 10.06, Dr. History. And then at 10.32, Cliff Sosaman will be on our program talking about honor, courage, and commitment, HCC Incorporated for our veterans. Very important. Right now, let's send it back over to our main studio. We're getting ready for the CBS News. I'll be back in about seven minutes. Don't you go away. Uh, Here we go, hour number two, Zeb at the Ranch on a Tuesday, May 2nd. Good morning, good morning, brought to you by our major sponsor, your Magic Valley Les Schwab Tire Centers, all seven locations serving you. And, of course, don't forget, too, some of our great advertisers like Western Way Services. From the canyons of the Snake River. Western Way Services, so loyal to the community and the people they serve, they are always at your disposal. Get on the route service, get rid of your garbage, call them up and say, I don't know what to do with this garbage, and they'll get you on the route service. And once a week, I mean, they're there, and your garbage is gone. Call them at 734-6969. Western Way Services, always at your disposal. Hey, don't forget on Mondays, Gardening for Idiots. Yeah, it's a program named after me. I'm not the best gardener in the world. And uh, Vicki at Vicki's Country Garden at 185 South 600 West of Paul is the host of that show. We just really enjoy asking her questions and everything. Celebrating 20 years in business with all your seed, your plants, all your decorative rock and bark, everything you need at Vicki's Country Garden in Paul. Mondays at 9.15. Don't you miss it. We're going to have uh, a gentleman on the air in just a minute talking about energy with the Energy and Environmental Legal Institute, so stand by for that. Also want to remind everybody about Autumn Haven Assisted Living Center at 924 Christian Way in Rupert, number to call 436-3200. They are the only locally owned and operated assisted living facility in the Minicasha area, and they urge, they urge you to stop by, take a tour, and just check them out. Boy, what a great place for your family members to stay and get the assistance that they need right there at Autumn Haven Assisted Living Center. Beautiful patio, barbecues, everything right at that location at 924 Christian Way in Rupert. They're small compared to some, but with a bigger heart than most. Autumn Haven Assisted Living Center in Rupert. And one more good word, and that course goes to Ark Animal Hospital at 750 21st Street in Hayburn. Hello, Dr. Bill, Dr. Liz, the whole crew. These are veterinarians that love animals. They have warm hearts for cold noses, and they really urge you right now to make sure your dogs and your puppies are all vaccinated against that very deadly parvovirus. Very deadly. So call them, stop in, 678-1177, 750 21st Street in Hayburn, Ark Animal Hospital, warm hearts for cold noses. Right now, let's go to the phone line. I know I am probably going to say his name wrong, 
He's been on my program a couple of times in the past, but I'm going to give it a shot, and then he can correct me. We have, with the legal, as a legal counsel for the Energy and Environmental Legal Institute, Kaya Mendelbaum. Did I say it correct? Yes, yes, you did. Great to be here again. Oh, Kayam, I'm really glad to have you on the air to discuss uh, what's going on with the President Donald Trump's request to pause a lawsuit that Obama started on Clean Power Plan. Give us kind of an update on this story and where is it as far as hopefully Trump redoing and throwing away a lot of the miscues that Obama had started. I'll be happy to. So as you, as you and your listeners probably know, back during the Obama administration, the Environmental Protection Agency imposed sweeping new regulations to, that would devastate the energy industry in this country. These were going to look to shut down a lot of coal-powered, fire, a coal-fired power plants that provide a lot of the electricity to this country. Now, only a couple months ago, President Trump signed an executive order telling the Environmental Protection Agency to review those rules with an eye towards making changes or eliminating them. And so the legal case that was going against the Obama-era rules, the court has now decided it's going to hold those cases in abeyance. What that means is rather than issue a ruling or continue the cases, it's just going to put them on pause for 60 days while it considers whether the pause should continue indefinitely or whether the entire rule should just be remanded back to the agency while the agency reviews the rule and decides what it's going to do. Okay, now, where are we at as far as the clean power plan? Kayam, I'm not so sure that this is going to be the death knell for this program. Uh, what possibility is it that it might come back and rear its ugly head again? Well, we can hope that it will be the death knell of the program, but that that's certainly a risk. Right now, the Environmental Protection Agency, under Administrator Pruitt, is examining the rule that the Obama-era EPA wrote. And they have to go through the proper administrative process if they decide to write a new rule, a better rule. And then they've got to move it forward and put it, and make it a regulation, replacing the Obama rule. Well, well now tell me... It's a long and complicated process. Yeah. It took the Obama administration almost six years before they put their rule in place. And so, because of the cumbersome process that exists, it takes time. And so it's important that now we make sure that the Obama rule doesn't go into effect while Administrator Pruitt and President Trump's EPA works on a new rule. You know, overall, Kayam, I want to ask you this. Overall, on energy and what Obama and his administration tried to do to basically return us to the dark ages of energy in this country and literally uh, run so many businesses out of business and just cripple the economy, what do you see as changes, transitions right now today after 102 days with the Trump administration? Well, it's still early, and so we haven't seen as many changes as we would like, but certainly there's an attitude change. Uh, and President Trump has talked about reforming the regulatory process to try and return power to states and local communities, rather than having the federal government try and do everything, which was so popular during the Obama administration. And that's an important step. But there hasn't been as much concrete development as anyone would like to see. We've seen executive orders telling agencies to begin reviewing rules and regulations, but it takes a lot of time to actually repeal any rules or regulations. And so right now, we're still in sort of a wait-and-see pattern, waiting to see how quickly uh, the Trump agencies are going to move to get rid of some of the rules that the Obama administration imposed. You know, and let me ask you this question, because I'm very concerned in the new spending bill, the budget, if you will, uh, there is a fraction of the Republican Party that wants the things done the same old, same old. And I noticed that yesterday they're going to still fund Planned Parenthood. They're still going to fund the EPA in its entirety. And we were all told that there would be severe cutbacks. What's going on here? Well, there it's really hard to say. I've uh, given and take the budget process. Nobody really knows what happens behind the scenes. I know the reports have been that 
they're going to try and do a better budget when, for the next fiscal year, the budget that's due in September. But certainly the budget that's been passed to finish off this year is concerning. I mean, it shows that there isn't a lot of effort on Capitol Hill to really reflect the priorities that, that the people voted for back in November. When you look at the overall scope of uh, what they're trying to do with the rescinding of a lot of the EPA and the governance of controlling the coal-fired power plants and other forms of energy, but then on the other side, you've got the left with all the money from Tom Steyer and George Soros and all the loons that are trying to disrupt everything. Really? In four years, can Trump really turn this into a victory for our economy and the and the private family in the United States of America to try to save and make some money? Honestly, I think it'll be difficult. And you're right, there's a tremendous amount of money coming into the West that far outstrips anything that goes to those who try and fight for a stronger U.S. economy, that try, that try to fight for fewer regulations. I mean, the left is incredibly well-funded, and they're incredibly ideologically committed to this idea of less energy, of only the right kind of energy, the sort of energy that people like Tom Steyer are happen to be invested in. Um, so it'll be, it's a difficult process, and it's made worse by the fact that so many people within the agencies are committed to this same cause. I mean, you've seen, we've all seen, you know, the reports coming out of agencies about the opposition with by the employees there to the administration's priorities. So I think it's going to take more than four years. I think we need eight years, and I think we need committed people everywhere who want to roll back these regulations in the agencies on Capitol Hill and in the White House. You know, in your opinion, Kaim, and you're a very sharp young man, but uh, I've come out on this program many, many times and said that global warming slash climate change, whatever they want to call it, is nothing more than a hoax and nothing more than a control issue for the populations of the world. And during the campaign, Trump came out many, many times and dismissed climate change as a hoax and uh, not even worth thinking about and has said that they were going to withdraw from the Paris Climate Accord. What are your thoughts? on all this is he going to follow through or with his daughter Ivanka and her husband who seem to lean towards climate change are they going to be an influence to where maybe he might change his mind I certainly hope not we need to withdraw from the Paris Accord uh, President Trump made it a, a signature promise during his campaign and it's something he needs to follow through on because ultimately if we don't then that's going to come to be seen as an obligation of the United States and someday someone's going to sue in court and you find a liberal court that's going to order the United States government to do what the Paris uh, Treaty said. Now, it's not a legitimate treaty. It wasn't passed by the Senate. It wasn't approved in any proper fashion. But someday, if we don't do something about it, you're going to find a judge who says, yeah, that should probably be a law. That should probably stand as equal to the laws of the United States. And so we're going to tell the government in an order, you have to do this. Let me ask you... So incredibly important that we withdraw, okay. and it would be incredibly disappointing if the administration decides not to follow through on such an important campaign promise. Kyle, let me ask you this. Uh, I'm sure you've read it. I'm sure you understand all the ins and outs of the Paris Climate Change, uh, the Accord. Uh, what devastating uh, particulars stand out to you as far as what it would do to hurt and harm the United States, our economy, and our industry? Well, what stands out to me in particular is two things. First, the, even though the accord requirements start off relatively reasonable, they ramp up over time. And so every five years, they're going to come back together and say, here, this is the new level that you have to drop to. And so every five years, we're going to be put in the same position of being told we haven't done enough, that we should be paying more money, that we should uh, have less energy and a, and a worse economy for the benefit of others. The second major problem is that we have very little control over the process. There's very little we can do to stop it, and every time it happens, we're going to be harangued by the global community, we're going to be harangued by liberals here in the United States that we have this obligation that we're not meeting. And they're going to use that in certain parts of the media to try and hammer whatever administration in order to get their agenda passed. When you t and ultimately, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy 
where this tries to impose more and more restriction on the United States and then hammers us every time we say, wait, no, this makes no sense. Absolutely. We have a caller with a question, and caller, I'm going to ask you to keep it brief. Go ahead, please. Well, you know, the thing about this is that the rest of the world, the emerging nations, India, you know, parts of South America, China, elsewhere in Asia, there's there is absolutely no concern whatsoever for this because they're in China alone. When you have to keep the employment level at, a, at as high a rate as you can possibly keep it, they can't be worried about global warming or smog, and they're not. And if you study it, you know that they have no intentions of starting to clean up their act until later into the future. And the, see, America is the is the bad guy, the culprit. And it, it, it always just comes back down to breaking America down to a third world nation, I guess. And uh, whether or not we're going to tolerate this lie, I'll hang up. Uh, please respond to the caller, Kaim, if you would, please. Thank you. Absolutely. I certainly agree that a lot of other nations, a lot of big polluters that are just as large, if not worse than us, have very little interest in changing. It seems to a very large degree their concern is what's the best for our people and our economy, whereas there are certain elements in the United States that don't seem to care about that, that would rather run with their own political agenda rather than focus on what's the actual interest of the United States. You know, the one thing uh, I'm going to ask you for maybe a correction on some of the verbiage that you just used that may be worse polluters than us. I take difference to that because I think, quite frankly, with the studies that I've had, Kayam, over the last 17 years, we are doing so much more than any highly developed country, and our water is cleaner, our air is more pure, everything is better in this country, and the others have gone the other way. That's what I take exception to oh no you're absolutely right but even by the even by the standards used by the left even by you know using their numbers you can see that they even they have to admit that countries like china put out more of what they call pollution than we do but they don't seem to care about that Okay, one last thought here, uh, and I've got uh, uh, to ask you this. The UN, the United Nations, I have maintained for a long time on this program that is nothing more than a puppet power type uh, control over various nations. I have said that they're going to be trying to impose uh, their wills and wants on the American people and possibly even our legal system. What are your thoughts and concerns about the United Nations with energy over the next decade? I certainly think that the United Nations has gotten too deeply involved in, uh, and politicized the energy field. You can see things like the International Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, has gotten it heavily politicized, heavily controlled by certain groups that want an outcome predetermined. And so I think it's become problematic for these sort of international organizations to be so heavily involved and so heavily cited when it comes to talking about this stuff. I think it's time for some of these organizations to step back and reform their processes. I agree. We have one more caller. Time for one more caller. Go ahead. You're on the air. Thank you. Well, the bottom line is we need to get out of the U.N. It's been an American pro-communist since its inception. And uh, the Agenda 21, you know, they're doing everything they can to destroy energy in this country to make us a third world country. And, of course... The other countries, you know, don't have the environmental pollution controls and so forth. And they also are the one, the a communist in charge of the refugee program. And now you, they're bringing in, they're trying to bring in more of these people one way or another. It's time to get out of the U.N. by uh, Congress passing H.R. 193 as a current bill would uh, sever our relationships with the U.N. and also move the U.N. out of the U.S. Okay. But a nest of spies has been since its inception. It has no redeeming value. All Thank right. Very much. I appreciate your call and respond, please, Kayam, if you would. Certainly, there are any number of problems with the United Nations, and I think that the minimum reforms are absolutely necessary in order for us to continue wanting to fund it, for us to continue wanting to be as heavily involved as we are. 
Well, I certainly want to tell you how much I appreciate you coming by this morning and uh, visiting with us, and I certainly hope things go the way that uh, we anticipate with President Donald Trump. One final thought for my audience, and I had a call after you were on the last time. I checked through the records. With the Energy and Environmental Legal Institute, basically what does that institute do on a daily basis to help us, the citizens? What we do is we are a watchdog organization. We monitor what the agencies are doing. We get records from the agencies, and we put them out to the public so the public can see what's really going on. You can come to our website, www.eelegal.org, and you can see all the documents we've gotten, and you can see all the records that show what's really going on behind the scenes in the agencies. Very well said press officer says to the media for what they're really saying in their emails, what they're really planning to do. Okay. And that's incredibly valuable because that sort of transparency is what helps prevent a deep state from existing. It's the sort of thing that helps prevent government employees from ignoring their obligations and doing whatever they feel like. Well, I want to tell you how much I appreciate all the times you've been on my show, and we'll look forward to having you back in the future. The Legal Counsel for the Energy and Environmental Legal Institute, Kaya Mendelbaum. Sir, thank you for sharing with us this morning, and I'll have you back in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. You bet. Thank you. Uh, Right now, we're going to pay some bills, and uh, we're going to tell you about our dear friends over at Hanson Mortuary. You know, boy, what a terrible, terrible, stressful time when there's the passing of a loved one, and you don't know what to do. You don't know what has to be done in a short period of time. I urge you to call Hanson Mortuary at 710 6th Street in Rupert, the number 436-5636. Joel Heward. His family and his staff, always there to serve you, and they can go to the rural towns and churches to help you with all the arrangements. All you have to do is give them a call, 436-5636, and they always treat you and your family with the highest ethical standards with unquestioned integrity. So be sure and remember that number, 436-5636, Handsome Mortuary in Rupert. My goodness, aren't we dressed up here this morning? This is overkill for this program, I'll tell you that. We've got some guests that will be with us in just a moment, so stand by. also want to remind you about Ramsey Heating and Electric Analytics, and of course, you know that they're offering up to $1,700 in rebates on their home comfort systems, so don't forget to give them a call today at Ramsey Heating and Electric, 678-0459. Ramsey Heating and Electric and Lennox, saving you money. In just a moment, and he's coming in the studio right now, we're going to have Lieutenant Governor... Mr. Brad Little on the phone with us and uh, live and direct from my office, so stand by. Don't forget Let's Ride, 270 Highway 24 between Rupert and the World. They're open Mondays through Fridays, 9 to 6, Saturdays, 9 to 4. And if you don't have a four-wheeler, you don't have a side-by-side, you'd better stop in and take a look at that showroom floor. My goodness, they've got all kinds, all colors ready for you because this is where the fun is sold. Stop over and see them today. Nick, Randy, the whole crew at Let's Ride, 270 Highway 24 between Rupert and the world. Yes, it's true. It's where the fun is sold. While you're over in that neck of the woods, too, don't forget our friends at Cameron and Siemens Insurance. They're located at Highway 24 between Rupert and Burley, and they would love to see you come by and talk about life insurance, health insurance, retirement planning, employee benefits, all of this and more from some individuals that are very accessible and devoted to your welfare. Please give them a call. Make an appointment, 436-4424. Cameron and Siemens Insurance, Highway 24 in Rupert. Right now, without further ado, we're going to welcome up to the microphone, and I'm going to ask you to get real, real close to that directional mic, and uh, good heavens, I haven't seen him for a long time, and the last time I did talk to him, he was wearing a pair of Wranglers like me and a cowboy hat. Lieutenant Governor Brad Little, how are you? I'm great, Zeb. Good morning. It's nice to have you here. It's nice to be here. It looks great around here. Welcome to the poor side of Murtaugh. Well, the poor side of <laughs> Murtaugh looks pretty darn good. Well, push that just a little closer okay. to you, would you? You're running for governor. I am. 
I, I, that rumor is true. The rumor is good. Yeah. I'm glad to hear that. Now, uh, let's see if I can remember some of the particulars about Lieutenant Governor Brad Little. 63 years old. That's correct. Okay. Uh, former senator. Correct. And has been the lieutenant governor since 2009. That's correct. Am I pretty good so yeah, far? That, that is correct. Rancher. Yes. Businessman. Yes. Family man. Family yeah. comes first. Yep. Tell us a little bit about your family. Well, we we actually uh, worked calves this weekend and had all the grandkids out there, and that's what makes things really fun is to get off of my this job and and get back to the ranch and and uh, we got a, one of my good friends who's worked for me for 31 years uh, yesterday and uh, his family and our family and and that's just. It just doesn't get any better than that. When you have a branding and you have grandkids and all the family, it could either be the Keystone Cops or the Ringling Brothers Circus. They, and and some of the guys helping us had their their kids there, too. And we got a pretty good squirrel population, and the little kids were chasing the squirrels in through the branding corral. And, and uh, But we had nobody got hurt, and uh, everything everything went just fine. So. Well, when the dust settles, it's a great day when everybody can sit around a campfire or something and have a glass iced tea or whatever. Why do you want to be governor? Tell us that. Well, I mean, that's part of it. I mean, I think right now we've had too many kids that have had to leave Idaho for whatever reason a lot of it's automation i mean those yeah. i was looking at some of the tractors as i drove in here how big they were some of the cultivators and you know a lot of rural you didn't see my little ferguson out <laughs> in the arena did you <laughs> but but you know a lot of it is whether it's in the mines or the mills or the farms or even the food processing plants it just takes fewer people to do things and we got to grow our economy in idaho to where those kids that are graduating uh, from Murtaugh High School or or Twin Falls High School or College of Southern Idaho have an opportunity to stay here, and that's really that's what that's the lens that I see everything through. Is we've got to have the velocity, particularly in our existing businesses, adding value to our agricultural commodities to where there's opportunities for people to for their families to. Stay here or to come back if they've left. Okay, but I guess the word would be how. How are we going to transition this so that we can create a better and more stable economy, an increasing economy, but not yet chase, change the face of the state of Idaho? Well, I, I mean, that's a lot of it to me, Zeb, is the more value we add to agricultural commodities, uh, the more we make them more profitable. Uh, the better it's going to be. Uh, right now, we're looking at putting in a new rail transfer station at Burley and Pocatello that will allow agricultural commodities here to, in essence, be closer to their end market, to the Midwest market, to the Eastern market, right. by having u- unit trains. That means that the people that are, like, see out the window from uh, from the ranch here, that those commodities are going to be more valuable, and we're going to make you know make finished potatoes, make finished. Uh, uh, milk products, make finish cattle uh, beef products to where the profitability and the value added is created right here in Idaho. And then we're going to have a lot of other industries. You know, there's nothing better than the work ethic of these farm kids. That's if, right. If you're doing a small manufacturing, if we got 250 companies in Idaho that are building uh, parts and pieces for the gun industry. We've got about 200 companies that are building uh, uh, products for the uh, aerospace industry. Those are perfect to put in these small communities because you got those work ethic kids that want to work with their hands that are there. That's those are great examples right there. Matter of fact, the governor's taking a trade mission uh, to the Paris Air Show, and it's companies from all over Idaho that are making aerospace products, and those are the kind of jobs that'll add value to the communities and be able to let their kids stay here. And let me ask you this, Lieutenant Governor, and I hope I can just call you Brad. We've been friends that's, for quite some that's time. That's correct. Uh, Education. I want to talk a little bit about education, and you may not agree with me on my concept, but I have said for a long time on this program that I think we, our generation, has pushed everybody's got to go to college, everybody's got to have a university degree, and I've differed with that. I've said, no, I don't agree with that. 
We've got a lot of the millennials right now that are up to a hundred thousand dollars in debt and see they can't even see over the rim of their glasses all the money that they owe. I have said for a long time that we have not pushed the trade schools for a long time for the electricians, the plumbers, the etc. Because we're really hurting for that. I talked to a plumber that came here from Burley three weeks ago, and he said when he goes out of business, he doesn't know where the people are going to be to come fix what we need fixed. Your thoughts? Well, I've, I've got a friend in Boise that's been there for a long time. He's got a plumbing company. He said he's today he's turning away million dollar jobs because he doesn't have enough plumbers. Exactly. Uh, we did the governor and the legislature would put together a task force on K twelve public education. Right now, there's a task force that's meeting, I think, monthly on what we're going to do on the career technical professional. And I firmly believe it's got to be both. It's got to be, Some of these kids need to be able to leave high school with enough skills where they can feed their families. Right. Um, when the economy got bad, a lot of the shop classes and those other classes were done away with. We are injecting money into that to where these kids can walk out of high school with a degree, with, with the skills they need uh, to be a welder, to program a CNC machine, uh, to do the understand the engineering, understand the modern equipment in these new food processing plants that are being built all over this valley. Whether it's amalgamated, whether it's McCain, whether it's Fabrical, whether it's Chobani, the the food processing plants of today are not your our father's food processing plants where there was a lot of manual labor in there. And we can teach a lot of those skills at high school to fill in that gap that you addressed. Brad, can we do one thing, though, that is necessary if we're going to have that success? We've got to reinstill a work ethic in the younger generation. Do you agree? That that's the most important and the most important door to get that done is the front door of your house to where a the value of hard work and b the value of an education is appreciated that i cannot emphasize that enough um i'm i'm headed to buell today and the reason i've got this necktie on is this is the color of the i noticed that of the, of, 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 of buell high school right. which That's just right. got ranked That's as right. one of the best high schools right. in the united states and we need, we need these school districts that are doing the right thing, particularly adding these career technical. We need to talk about them. I'm a big local control guy, but we need to highlight these school districts that are being really successful so that their neighbors and the school districts adjacent to them learn from their, what they've done right. Um, I'm going to speak at a graduation here in about two weeks where – the the kid that asked me will already have his his uh, associate's degree and he's going to go on to get an engineering degree. But there's some of his classmates that have got all kinds of skills that they can go to work in a modern uh, machine shop or a welding uh, facility because of the education they're being offered at that institution. Brad, what would you say is the biggest challenge to the state of Idaho that has not been met so far by any administration previously? What would you like to really get your hands into and try to change to make better for the state? Well, I, I, I actually think you touched on it. I think the, the career technical professional education, right, you know, uh, in 2010, 11, any kind of a job was great. Yeah. Because, but now we've got now we're the fastest growing state in the union in jobs, and we've got all these unmet needs, particularly well in both areas in the high in the higher education area, but mainly in the career technical area, and that's what we need to do because that will continue the uh, propelling the state forward. Obviously, because of my background, I'm always interested in water. That water, you know. Today, we we resolved part of that issue with the agreement that uh, Speaker Ved, Vedke worked on the right. uh, summer before last. But we need to continue to emphasize both the quality and the quantity of water going forward because it's so important to our state. But But I think the educational aspect of it and the economic aspect of it, we need, and I have some people that disagree with, we need to increase uh, incomes and wages. Obviously, my area of commodities, I can't fix the price of cattle. I, right. can't, I can't fix the price of wheat or the price of potatoes. But we can add value and create more value here in Idaho where we 
harvest more of that value here in Idaho versus having to go somewhere else, making it the best product in the world for the export market. You you name the, you know, for the market in the in the East Coast, in Southern California, uh, making the best possible products here because that will raise the profit level not only for the processors but for the producers also. Let me ask you this real quick, Brad, on education. I was offended by some of the advertisements that were on television and the radio that portrayed Idaho students as being know-nothings and losers, and quite frankly, showing them getting off a bus in the middle of nowhere. I was offended by that because, correct me if I'm wrong, almost 70% of our uh, yearly budget here in the state of Idaho goes towards education, and quite frankly, I think we've got some doggone good uh, districts and uh, leaders and teachers. That's uh, I, I agree 100%. The issue is we we've got school districts that are doing the right thing i mean really doing the right thing right the state uh, the governor and the and the legislative branch are committed to making uh, uh teacher compensation competitive to where we can a get good uh young people going in the teaching profession and b not lose them these communities on the edge of the state, particularly if they're next to Wyoming or next to Washington, have been losing a lot of educators, and and that's why that was such a big priority. I am very happy that the legislature uh, made that big investment this year in education because it was a continuance of our plan to advance that going forward. We we got a lot of work to do in education. There's no question about it. But we have examples all over the state of districts that are just doing a rip-snorting good job, and we need to highlight those and help those other districts get up to that level. Brad, when you look at uh, the last question I asked about the biggest challenges to the state of Idaho, what do you think are the biggest opportunities for the state of Idaho? It's it's really it's our resources and the people, but it's mainly the people. Uh, when... I was down at the SHOT Show with a bunch of uh, of um, ammunition and gun manufacturers from Idaho. We were down in Nevada, and I almost had to beat them off with a club. The companies from California that want to come to Idaho, and obviously the regulatory environment, obviously the tax environment, obviously our pro-Second Amendment position, but mainly they talked about the the, the recruitment of uh, people to work in their plants, they just had a different mindset than what they had in California. It's that work ethic when they get here. If you talk to people that have got plants all over the world, all over the West, uh, they will tell you that that work ethic here in Idaho is incredibly important. I am concerned that because of some of the labor laws where we can't have kids we're, we're trying to get a bill through to where loggers kids can go out with their moms and dads on logging jobs and not get cited for some labor violation absolutely we've got the same thing in agriculture but we need these kids while they're in in junior high and high school to be exposed to a day's labor to where they understand it so that when they walk out of high school or walk off of a campus they know what it's like to work 8, 10, 12 hours a day, and that that's expected of them, and the, in fact that they like it. Lieutenant Governor Brad Little, and we're going to have more with him in just a moment. Time for our weather brought to you by Phillips Oaks Goodwin Crane and Company CPAs, providing accounting services to the Minicash area for well over 50 years. With the Bex of tax, tax return preparation, tax planning, along with retirement planning, all of this and so much more. With two locations, Burley and Rupert, Phillips Oaks Goodwin Crane and Company. And right now, here's Gina with the weather. Today it's going to be a little bit on the windy side, but as we make our way towards the weekend, it's going to feel a little bit like summer. Mostly sunny skies for today. Winds out of the west right around 18 miles an hour. We are expecting a high of 63 tonight, low of 39 tomorrow. Mostly sunny skies, high of 71 with an overnight low of 42 Thursday. Oh, Thursday's going to be nice. Sunny skies, high of 79. Overnight low of 50 for Friday, even better. Mostly sunny skies, high of 83 with an overnight low of 53. Then for Saturday... A few clouds will be rolling in, partly cloudy skies, high of 76. That is your weather for Zebeth Aran. Thank you, Gina. Brought to you by Phillips Oaks, Goodwin Crane, and Company. CPAs that care, CPAs that can help you, your family, and your business. Get a hold of them today in Burley and Rupert, Phillips Oaks, Goodwin Crane, and Company. 
We're on the phone with Lieutenant Governor Brad Little, and he's running for governor, and of course he has been in the past a state senator, and then from 2009, Lieutenant Governor. You know, you were playing the second fiddle for a long time, and now you want to run for the big chair. Uh, how hard is it trying to go from behind a Butch Otter into the main office as the governor? I mean, that's got to be a tough deal, isn't it? Well, I've been very fortunate that, that the governor has been very, very generous with what he allows me to do, whether it's helping in appointments, doing interviews for people that are in agencies that do things that, in my former life, I had no idea. I participate in all the leadership meetings with legislative leadership, both the majority and the minority. I I participate in all the cabinet meetings. I go to all the capitals for a day for him. And then I spend a, a huge amount of my time uh, doing economic development all over the state. Uh, and this, this valley has been one of the funnest ones to come to by far. So I'm there are very few things that I don't think I've been exposed to. Obviously, this winter with the bad weather, uh, a lot of what we were exposed to was was both the effects of the massive snow yeah. and now the flooding. Matter of fact, the weather forecast about it warming up. I'm a little concerned about the Wood River Valley because they still got 200 percent of precip over there, and what's going to happen when this? If we hit 80 degrees, the same thing in the Payette River drainage and the Boise River drainage. Uh, but I still love a good spring. Idaho's a dry state uh, you want that precipitation we just don't want it all coming off at once amen you know when you talk about some of the problems that if you become governor you're going to have to address and they're going to have to actually start on some of this soon infrastructure it's fallen apart thanks to in part a lot of the moisture we had this year uh medicaid health insurance i mean how would you respond to some of those problems because they have not been addressed and they have not been solidified well i I chaired the task force on transportation in 2010 or 11, I think, and and uh, I, I I understand the problem. Uh, I also understand it's hard to raise taxes, and that yeah. should be. That's yeah. that's in our DNA. It should be. We have to make the case as leaders of the state of Idaho, both local and and statewide, about the need to make. The, as the governor says. Uh, not doing your maintenance is the same as deficit spending. It right. just uh, it, it it doesn't show up on the balance sheet, but it is incredibly important that we maintain uh, these threads that are important uh, for the state to continue with commerce and to keep our people safe. Uh, healthcare healthcare is too expensive. We are somewhat at the uh, under the thumb of the federal government of the way they regulate healthcare. Outside of that. Idaho is still one of the most affordable places to buy an insurance policy if you're on a group policy right. of any state. But that still doesn't mean we need to drive down the cost of health care uh, to our citizens and to the businesses that provide health care for their employees. We have a caller with a question. Caller, I'll ask you to keep it short and precise and concise. Go ahead, please. You're on the air. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, if we study grazing... Okay, catastrophic forest fires in Idaho. There was a time when forest fires, because we had grazing, sheep, cattle, and uh, the sheep could go where the cattle shouldn't go, and a big forest fire was six, 7,000 acres, 60s and 70s. Now, when they burn 160,000 or more, and they say they're not going to go out until, you know, winter comes, and you say to yourself, this kind of mismanagement of our forests, and there's so much of it that's federally controlled. Forest Service, BLM, and, and, and the environmental leeches that are running this situation. And, 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 you know, you and I, once we lose a forest, the three of us will never see that forest the way it was. And I don't know, I know you're limited on what you can do, but this is an issue that has got to be squared away soon, because if I see another 160,000 acres go down this year, I'm, I'm beyond that. I'll hang up. All right. Respond, please, to the uh, caller. You're, you're, you're singing for my hymnal. Matter of fact, my back of my pickup out in Zeb's driveway says, Thin the Threat. 
Uh, we absolutely have to have more active management of these forest lands. We do it on our private lands in Idaho. We do it on our state lands. The federal government is woefully behind what they need to do and what they used to do back in the 80s and, and through the 80s. I was probably, I sued the federal government during the Clinton administration on their roadless rule and was successful. Uh, I understand what it takes um, uh, to get this done. And obviously, a big step is this new administration, the new Congress. Uh, I just got an email this morning about a lawsuit that was settled in North Idaho where an active plan to do uh, management to go out and thin that threat, to do some logging on the Forest Service. It was litigated by the environmental community, and the judge said, no, the community did the right thing. This is what needs to be done. We need to significantly accelerate that going forward on on both the, the grazing grounds because of the the fuels we're going to have this year and also on the forest ground uh, we uh, the the good neighbor authority which governor otter work with the western governors is a great step in that way to where we'll have a lot more management on these federal grounds but it's still going to be a battle and we're going to have to keep working on it Brad, let me ask you this question, and it may take me 30 seconds to get this out, but uh, with the new administration, the Trump administration, if you're elected in 18, you'd be working in basically Trump's second year. Your first year as governor, his second year as president. Uh, there's a lot of hatred and animosity that doesn't look like it's going to go away from the Democrats any anytime soon, and there's also a power play within the Republican Party where they've been causing a lot of strife. As a potential governor, of a highly Republican conservative state. How do you respond to all this infighting and the backbiting? That's politics. Yeah. Uh, but, but I really do think that collectively that that the state of Idaho, that, that, you know, obviously the loggers in the state of Idaho and the ranchers in the state of Idaho and the farmers in the state of Idaho and every group, that collectively, if we go together with all those other western states that supported the president and supported those Republicans in Congress, we can, right now they're getting ready to make some appointments. One of the appointee, potential appointees who will be over the Forest Service is a, 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 a man that I know very well from Idaho um, who uh, used to work for Senator Crapo, and and we've got to get those people in place uh, to where people can see that we're going to get things done. It, it's never going to be perfect. Our, our constitutional system doesn't allow for perfection. Right. It allows for a slow, cumbersome process, but we've got to get to work on it, and I think we're going to see some things happen with this administration that are going to that are going to alleviate the concerns of some of my friends in Idaho, some of the people that don't want us to do anything and like the status quo of the last eight years are probably not going to be happy, but such is life. You know, let me ask you about health care, Medicaid, etc. We've had a lot of problems in the last couple of legislative sessions with trying to figure out the Medicaid problem with approximately 80,000 people that are not covered here in the state of Idaho. And then, of course, the debacle with Obamacare, etc. What are your thoughts on health insurance and the solving of the Medicaid problem? Well, I like uh, two years ago, the governor's, uh, uh, you know, initial step, which took and uh, and put in a uh, in the place a system to where people particularly with diabetes uh, chronic heart disease they we help you know without a big investment we help put together a program to where they got into care the issue is if we don't take care of them we're going to pay for them anyway they're going to be on your local property taxes they're going to drive the cost of hospitalization um i am anxious they you now i i just read this morning that there's a new uh uh affordable care act replacement that's that's the genesis of it is taking place right there we are more than willing here in idaho um uh, the the legislature and the governor you tell us what the rules are for a while, so that we don't have to uh, be jerked back and forth, uh, you tell us what the rules are, and we will address that. But we've been under this unstable situation where the Affordable Care Act was non-sustainable, and we don't know what the path forward is. You give us a path forward, uh, we'll address it. One quick question. I'm almost out of time this morning. I wish I had more time. Is that uh, the immigration problem here in the United States, and I'm going to call it the refugee problem. And I'll state my case 
case is that I think we have to be very careful about who's coming in and for what purpose and try to find out a better vetting process for with more information. What are your thoughts about how to solve this with immigration and refugees being forced upon a lot of people here in the Northwest? I agree 100%. I you know the the initial refugee uh, legislation, the statutory overarching legislation, was passed in 1982. 1982, we didn't have a sect of a religion whose sole goal was to kill capitalist American, uh, you know, constitutional Republican. Uh, uh, that their whole goal wasn't to do that. Uh, the questions that we have asked of the administration about the vetting process have still been less than satisfactory. I, you know, the, the some of the refugees, a, a lot of the refugees, uh, have have been vetted, but there's a lot of them that are in these camps right. that, that it's almost impossible. Right. I believe this administration is on the path uh, to assure that the vetting process works, uh, uh, and and that those people that are into this that are come into this state are are not going to be a risk. That 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 uh, that radical group that that wants to do harm to America that we and and we may need to extend the follow-up period on that that's something that there's certain things the state can't do because of the cost the way the Constitution's written but there's certain things we can do and and I'll be interested to see what this administration proposes because we might want to go a step further here in Idaho about what we do to to uh, assure it but I'm I I believe that they're on track this administration to increase the comfort level for those of us in Idaho that are concerned about the the issue. You know, we're almost out of time, but I'm going to take a minute right here, and I'd like you to just kind of give a summation as to why you, Brad Little, would like to be governor of this great state of Idaho. Well, Zeb, thanks. I I just believe passionately that Idaho's we've got so many opportunities here in Idaho. And like I said at the onset, the big deal for me is that we, as as modernization of every industry, agriculture, you name it, goes forward, we have an obligation to grow opportunities here in Idaho to where our kids can stay here, they can thrive here, our grandkids can stay here, that Idaho is the best possible place to live, work, and raise a family. We're, we're pretty top of that list right now, and I think if we just keep driving the economy forward, doing the right thing to protect our resources, uh, we will continue to be in that position. Lieutenant Governor Brad Little running for governor and i wish you a lot of success it's always been a pleasure to be around you and visit with you i don't know this gentleman here but it's nice to have you in the studio the unsung hero in the background huh and uh, brad please come back and see us thanks Sam. thank really you very much it. ladies and gentlemen we're going to send it back over to our main studio right now for the cbs news i'll be back in about seven minutes <laughs> Oh, thank you, thank you. We're running a little bit late, and you didn't even know it, but I've got some things I've got to cover here. The last half hour, we were very honored to have Lieutenant Governor Brad Little on our program, and we thank him for his time here this morning. Uh, Zebeth Ranch, and of course, with our major sponsor, your Magic Valley Les Schwab Tire Centers, all seven locations serving you, along with some of our great advertisers like Western Way Services, always at your disposal. Want to remind your Mother's Day's coming up. It's right around the corner. Look, there it is. The Goody Shop at 133 West Main in Burley. Oh, they can make all kinds of special things for Mom. You know those Goody Goody baskets from the Goody Shop? Along with the special Mother's Day's mugs. You check it out. Oh, delicious food from the Goody Shop. 133 West Main in Burley. Number to remember, 647-0106. Along with the Drift in, Hey, take Mom out to dinner. Oh, they're going to have a special day for mom on the 14th at 545 F Street in Rupert. Don't forget they're going to have prime rib, finger steaks, chicken cordon bleu, and so much more at the Drift Inn. Make a reservation, 436-1300, the Drift Inn on the square in Rupert. Last but not least, a young man that says, I want to salute all the moms, and that's Doug at Doug's Alternator and Starter Service, 635 21st Street in Hayburn. Get your alternator and your 
Kickstarter work done right now. And don't forget, Doug says congratulations to all the fabulous moms out there. Happy Mother's Day from Doug's Alternator and Starter Service. There you go. Now, real quick, before we get started on our program, I also want to remind you about our friends over to Autumn Haven Assisted Living Center at 924 Christian Way in Rupert, only locally owned and operated assistant living center in... uh, Minicash area. That's right. And they really would like to have your family members come by, check them out. It is a great place to stay, a great place for them to help you. Autumn Haven Assisted Living Center at 924 Christian Way in Rupert, 436-3200. And they make every effort to make Autumn Haven the best place. They're small compared to some, but with a bigger heart than most. You be sure and stop in and see them today. Now, I'm hurrying. Uh, it's time for Minicasha Sales to bring you Dr. History at 1321 East Main Street in Burley, right across from the airport with my dear friend Zach and the crew, 8782091. And without further ado, as he's sitting there like a great big horse ready for the Kentucky Derby this next weekend. Yeah, yeah. it is this next weekend. Ooh, I love watching that. Yeah. yeah. Have you got a favorite? I, I don't really, you know, if it was somebody that was, I thought could be a triple crown winner, then I, but I, I'm not that familiar with those that are running this year. You know, there's only one or two that really stand out that I've seen run at various races on that horse racing channel, you know, prior to the Kentucky Derby. I don't think, and I agree with you, there's going to be a triple crown winner this year. Last year was close. Yeah, close, but no cigar. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of which, uh, in the old days, a lot of cigars and everything, but uh, what are you going to talk about this morning? I'm going to talk about a horse thief. Oh, my. And you know how they were treated in the Old West. (laughs) They used to find a stout limb. Yeah, yeah. Well... Okay, uh, there's something I could say about that, too, and I might. But uh, So I'm taking this firsthand from a guy that came out west, and r- this is his word. So I, I put more stock into somebody's personal journal and writings than something second or third hand. Kind of a passed-down story, yeah. Right. So, But uh, it w- this was just a young man. Him and his brother came out, and they uh, were headed to Idaho, and uh, there was a guy that, said, you know, okay, Idaho's a great place to go, but he he wrote a little song for these two brothers. A song. A song. Like in... A song with the hang guitar. Down, hang down your head, Tom Dooley. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> so here's some of the words he wrote. He said, and singing this, which I won't do. Uh, please don't. Yeah. He yeah. says, hurrah, hurrah for the UP road and a ride over the rolling plain. We are going out to Idaho and intend there to remain. And if the Indians capture you, you will be lucky to save your head. They have a habit of taking your scalp unless your hair is red. Unless <laughs> your hair is red. Yeah, I, I think, you know, it, 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 it rhymed it with... It had to be something that yeah, rhymed. it had okay. to rhyme with that. So he was trying to intimate that all the Irishmen would be safe. I guess. Yeah. I guess. So, I'm going to step out on a limb once more and say, I bet nobody's heard of a guy named Dave Simpson. No comment. And just leave it with that. Okay. Okay, so this guy's name is Charles Walgamot. So I'm going to refer to him. Oh. And, and you've heard of him probably. Oh, yeah, many times. Yeah. So anyway, uh, this was 1876. Dave Simpson was a blacksmith, and he came from Oregon and settled on the old Oregon Trail at Rock Creek Station, yep. just a few miles from yep. us right here. Yep. And there he started a blacksmith business. Now, he was a single man. He was about 35 years old, and he was kind of a big guy. Kind of, They say robust, which means to me he was... He was a portly uh, son of a he, gun. He was big. <laughs> but he had a rather pleasing disposition and manner that kind of enabled him to be friends yeah. with, with a lot of people. Yeah. So, good, uh, good personality type guy. Anyway... Uh, after time, it became rumored by the small cattlemen, and I'm going to distinguish between the small cattlemen and the big cattlemen. Okay. All right? So keep that in mind as we go along. Anyway, it became rumored by the small cattlemen that Dave Simpson was a horse thief and that his blacksmith shop only gave him an excuse for existence. Now, some rumors had it that Simpson was the leader of a gang of horse thieves that operated through Nevada, Idaho, and Montana. Oh, boy. So he was supposedly the ringleader of these outfits. And he ran a blacksmith shop. Yeah, sort of. Okay. But so anyway, if these rumors were true, Dave Simpson must be, in fact, a very peculiar man 
because he had a reputation for honesty and truth and upstanding among the people that he transacted business with. It was excellent. I mean, what did he pull the wool over their eyes? <laughs> well, he sort of maybe did. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but he put on a really good front. Okay, uh-huh. but uh, still, it was known that Simpson made a lot of night rides. Okay. Oh, really? He yeah. liked to go in the dark. Yeah, yeah. I see. Not glow in the dark. Uh-huh. <laughs> But, uh, however, he could always explain his absences, and from the fact that he was accused of horse stealing only by the small cattlemen, okay? I see. Remember I said that? Yeah. And so the people at the trader's store and along the stage road, uh, they lightly thought lightly of the cattleman's accusation, and... In fact, we're disposed to give Dave Simpson a lot of latitude. So, in other words, the small cattlemen were making the accusation that the old blacksmith was maybe uh, filling his corrals with some of their horses. But the bigger outfits, they just kind of, you know, he's okay. Okay. Anyway, so under the existing custom and ruling established by the cowmen, they showed a big distinction between horse stealing and the taking of the other fellow's calf. Or cow. I see. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, they legalized one and making the other punishable by hanging without a trial. Uh, and again, at the hands of the small cowmen. Really? So, large cattlemen rarely resorted to these measures of, you know, firing. Well, the little bitty guys couldn't afford to lose those No, they horses. couldn't. No. So, but you know, there's a rule of the Cattlemen's Association about calves. If they did not have a mark or a brand and were not following their mothers, yep. they were termed a maverick yep. and could be branded by anyone having a registered brand. Mm-hmm. Now, it was supposed that the calf should be at least nine months old, but custom kind of maybe ignored that age yeah. limit. You know, they might have been a month old, you know, or knows, less. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyway, if it so happened that a cowman accidentally stole his neighbor's calf and was caught, he was expected to change the brand. Yes. But if a man accidentally put his saddle on the other man's horse, they just pretty well hung him by the neck until he was dead. Yeah, really. I mean, it was tough life. Yeah. And, and there wasn't always a marshal involved. No, no. So, do you want to take a break? Right I, I will then? right now, and I'll okay. tell everybody about uh, great weather coming up. And uh, at Minicasha Sales, they've got all your metal and your shingle roofing, and they've got the windows of all sizes from the great western windows. They've got all your interior and exterior doors. They've got all that beautiful luxury vinyl planking. All of this and more with Zach and the crew at Minicasha Sales, 1321 East Main Street in Burley, right across from the airport, 878 one. Don't forget Minicasha sales. And also, I want to remind everybody, i got to put another commercial in here. Like I said, we're running a little bit behind. Kelly's Bearing Supply at 1407 East Main Street in Burley. And uh, you'll know where you're at when you always get your bearings at Kelly's. Stop in and see Zach and Brett and Alex, the whole crew. They keep everything right there on hand. Bearings, chains, brackets, everything at Kelly's Bearing Supply. 1407 East Main Street in Burley, 678-9398. Now, back to Dr. History, brought to you by Minicasha Sales. All righty. So here we got Dave Simpson. Uh, and at the t- as time went on, Dave Simpson's habits seemed always to be the same. To go out he at did, night. Yeah. Each day he could be heard pounding, red-hot iron in his little blacksmith shop, and some nights his horse was missing uh-huh. from the picket rope or the pasture. Oh, but, he needed exercise. Yeah, but daylight the next morning always found Dave in his shop and his horse in the customary place. Where did they keep these horses that he supposedly took? I don't know. I'm assuming he... They took him somewhere and sold him, but he yeah. couldn't have bought, brought him back here. Well, did he have cohorts in crime? Uh, yeah, that's the oh. that's the claim. I mean, from Montana, Nevada to Idaho. Oh, really? But he w- this occurred right around here. I see. So, anyway, it was a sure thing that no one would personally accuse Simpson of horse stealing unless he was sure that he had the drop on him because Simpson was a good shot. Mm-hmm. He was not a coward, and his six-shooter was just as much a part of his daily dress as was his shirt. So really? Now, you think of the blacksmith. 
I don't ever remember seeing a blacksmith carrying a, a six a six shooter. Do you? Well, yeah, Newly did on uh, Gunsmoke. Oh, all right. <laughs> okay. Well, most of the time they didn't. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, you asked. I know. I know. Okay. okay. Anyway, you know the stock business, especially the cattle industry at that time, was in a uh, kind of a peculiar position in the Snake River Valley, right through here. Yeah. Now there was a brand called the Shoe Soul. Yep. Right over you, here. Yeah. You you've yep. heard that. I've seen it. Yep. Yeah. Anyway, it consisted of. You considerably better than a hundred thousand head of cattle. Wow! And that ranged uh, from Goose Creek to the east of us uh, in the summertime, and the lowlands of the Snake River Valley in the wintertime. Yeah. So big. All, all through here. Big outfit. But this made it possible for the small cattlemen to kind of augment their herds very rapidly and still keep within the law. Oh, you don't mean they could have found a few mavericks. A few. Um, and and maybe quite a few. <laughs> you know, really, when you stop and think about it, though, Doc, uh, the bigger ranchers like the shoe sole. And knowing that their calf crop, they kept records, even back then, really good records. Wouldn't they know that, hey, man, all of a sudden 20% of their calves are missing? Well, I, I think the thieves were selective. Uh. <laughs> you know, I, because, you know, you got 100,000 cows. You know, a calf might drop and be dead when sure. it drops. Selective and, thievery. You know, yeah. or drown. Or yeah. anyway, so. Anything can happen. Yeah. So anyway, the Cattlesman Association had employed a detective to catch Dave Simpson oh, this stealing is, horses. This is sinister. And in cases like this, the detective usually finds his evidence. Uh-huh. Okay. Now, at least this one did. And it was sufficiently that the small cowman determined that Dave Simpson must hang. All oh, right. Oh. Here we go. So he was a dangerous man and against their interests. And that very night, three or four men armed with rifles and shotguns waited in hiding until a, quote, stool pigeon informed them that Dave Simpson had gone to bed in his blacksmith shop. Uh huh. Then, with their guns fully cocked, they entered the door and each man pointing his gun at Simpson's head and they said, Hands up. <laughs> what do you think he did? <laughs> I think he agreed. And one of the gang said, now, Dave, we're not afraid of you. And Simpson just kind of smiled and said, well, I should think not. Uh, you know, you can just see this conversation going on. So, yeah, yeah, anyway. yeah. So, well, immediately a horseman was sent east, traveling uh, east and onto the Raft River country, notifying cattlemen to meet at a point designated in the foothills west of Albion, in the cedar where Dave Simpson, after a trial, would be hanged. Now, to our listeners out there... That's just right up here. Yeah. So our listeners, uh, you, uh, think of south-central Idaho, the Snake River, a little town called Albion. Yeah. And th- that's where we're talking, right out here. Yeah, don't go to Albion don't if you want to get hung. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so Charles Walgamont. He, now, he yeah. was just a young man. Charlie Walgamont. Charlie. Yeah. And this is what he said. He said... I was. It was just as we were sitting down to breakfast at the Harrington Ranch that four horsemen drew reins at the front door. Mr. Harrington invited them in. The party consisted of three cowmen with Dave Simpson, who was in irons. Oh. So he was handcuffed, yeah. basically. Now, the cook, who was a man and used to these sudden additions to the family table, soon arranged the extra places, and they all sat down to breakfast, the cowmen having stacked their guns in the corner, Dave Simpson ate with his hands manacled. So really, so still handcuffed. Now he knew he was going to probably stretch a rope, and he still had a big breakfast. Well, I don't know how much he ate. Oh. <laughs> you know. Anyway, so Charles goes on. He says, "Of the people who sat at that t- breakfast table that morning, just one man besides myself self is still living, and he his name is Asel Murray. All right." Oh, really? Have you heard that name? Yes. All right. So, anyway, during the breakfast, there was not a word spoken about Simpson. And immediately after breakfast, both Asel Murray and myself, who were both outsiders, as it were, went to our separate duties and saw no more of this crowd until we were called to an early dinner, uh-huh. which passed on, as did the meal before, with Simpson... Eating in handcuffs. He's still eating. He's still eating. I mean, man, this he's guy, got a, he ain't a, worried. He's, he's got a positive attitude. Yeah, I would say. So anyway, it says, at the close of dinner, everyone, excepting Simpson and myself, arose and stepped outside. So he says, when alone, uh, he asked him, he says, what's this all about, Simpson? And Simpson said, I am accused of horse stealing. And from what I can gather from their conversation, they intend to take me to the Cedars, this side of Albin, and hang me. 
So that was his understanding. Oh, okay? my goodness. Now, kind of a cool hand Luke yeah, about it. Yeah. So Charles, he said, he kind of felt sorry for Simpson, and he said, Dave, step into that room, the window's up, and opens on the creek, which is heavily willowed from here clear to the canyon. Simpson looked at his handcuffs, hesitated, and before he could act, the door opened, and Simpson was told to come on. <laughs> Uh-oh. So he had like a split second. He might have, but you know, with handcuffs, how far are you going to run? Well, no. well I guess it depends how on... far are you going to run? That's an oxymoron. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so Asel McMurray had been ordered to bring their horses, and the outfit left accompanied by Mr. Harrington. And this is at night? Yeah. Okay. So I would have liked to bid Simpson goodbye and to say a consoling word if I could have thought of anything, but I did not. He said it was better to treat the circumstances with indifference, and there was no goodbye said. Really? So, later that night, and this is again him talking, he says, Along in the after part of that night, I was awakened by men entering the dining room and could hear... They're going to eat again? (laughs) Hey, you know, you got to eat. (laughs) Anyway, they entered the dining room, and, and he said he could hear them placing sagebrush on the fireplace fire and by their voices recognized them as the cattlemen on their return. Okay? So, Charles, he says, I got up. I took a peek into the room. To my surprise, I saw Simpson sitting by the fireplace. Oh, my goodness. Still in irons. (laughs) Okay. Now, after breakfast the next morning, you know, they're eating. They're thinking, right? So, breakfast the next morning, we heard that they were going to send him to Silver City, the county seat, which they did. Mr. Harrington told me that they had taken Simpson to the Cedars west of Albion, where they met a number of cattlemen. They placed a rope over Simpson's neck and gave him a trial. And I'm sure that was a very just trial, right? Oh, yeah. See, anyway, he says, a man by the name of James Iverson, who lived at Cottonwood, some few miles west of Oakley, took it upon himself to talk for Simpson, urging the crowd to turn him over to the law. Harrington, who was a very just fellow, also urged that it would be better for all, and a majority vote to turn him over to the authorities took place, and that was the vote. You know, now, let's break this down real quick in the time remaining. That Harrington you're talking about, I believe, now I could be wrong on this, but I believe from what's been told to me, Harrington Fork up there in the South Hills, that's named after him. Okay. Yeah, yeah that, that, and that probably is. Yeah. So, anyway, the, you know, uh, Charles says that Simpson probably deserved hanging. Well, what happened to the guy? Well, let me keep going. I mean, well, hurry. <laughs> okay. Okay, so Simpson was never brought to trial. Never? Never brought to trial. And it says, he says, and I doubt if any of these men would have appeared against him. You know, because if he didn't get uh, uh, sentenced, he could come after these guys. Yeah, but wait a minute. I mean, you can't go back to your hometown and live happily ever after. Well, he could have slipped in at night, you I know. See, yeah. anyway, so, but anyway, so he was in jail, all right? Yeah. He was in jail. Down in Nevada. Silver City. Silver City. That's Idaho. Oh, okay. Right? I thought you yeah. meant down in Nevada. I'm sorry. So anyway, it says that he escaped during a jailbreak. And Charles says, and I understand that sometime later was killed when he resisted an officer for a crime committed in Washington Territory. Really? So he must have drifted off up into... So old old Dave wasn't too good a guy. He skipped the rope, but he caught a bullet. Yeah. Somewhere. Eight lead. <laughs> yeah. So that's the story of Dave Simpson, the horse thief. And... But that's right here. Yeah. I mean, it's from where we're sitting and that grove of trees and cottonwood and everything, we're talking just a matter of a few miles. Yeah. I, yeah. And I love stories that are close by where we live because yeah. you and I can picture. Maybe the rope's still there. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, uh, Black Jack or uh, uh, Diamond Field Jack. Yeah. You've read that story oh, where yeah. the bullets were found. By this guy just a few years ago. Yeah. That that uh, anyway. That's a story that maybe I shouldn't have brought that up. I, or you know, if you want to listen to that story about Diamond Field, go back a few months and we have a story about Diamond Field. Yeah, you've done it many times on yeah. this program. So and that's an interesting story. They have to write right, Holy cow. right so, around here. So old Dave Simpson avoided the rope. He was a horse thief, but he got shot. <laughs> he got shot. Holy. You know. And a lot of those people you mentioned. Yes, I know the names. Yeah. 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 Well, and, and you're I'm, old enough to know them personally. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, I went to school with the Simpsons. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good story. Yeah, I, like I know. That. I, I, I like, like to that. think that uh, the the good family carried on. Ah, they somehow. did. They did. Yeah. Uh, next week, what are we going to do? 
Well, I don't know. I've got one about vigilantes, and that's another one. That- you know, they really walked a fine line. Oh, yeah, they did. They uh, they were basically day uh, nice people, and by night they weren't so nice. Well, you know, they sometimes they did what they had to do, and sometimes they did more than it what. went more so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I do have a story that happened right around us here, too. Good, let's that. That I, I might want to, might want okay. to do that next Any week. Any of them named uh, Turner? At no. Oh, okay. <laughs> Mine came from England. They were law-abiding citizens. Yeah, right. Okay. None of them were horse yeah, thieves. Yeah, right. I tell you what, <laughs> that we know of. Okay. Uh, good job. Thank, Thank you. you. Doctor History brought to you by Minicasha Sales, thirteen twenty-one East Main Street in Burley, right across from the airport. Old Zach and the rest of the crew ready to serve you. Nice, nice people. And uh, along with all the windows and the interior and exterior doors, they can help send a contractor over to do the installation. Minicash Sales, 1321 East Main Street in Burley. Uh, i got to talk to Dr. History in just a few minutes when he before he gets ready to go, but I want to remind everybody, too, that uh, on Thursdays we have another great segment on our program called Cashew County School Days, and it's brought to you by A Child's World at 1308 Overland in Burley, and they've got all kinds of new spring dresses arriving, and ladies you can choose from and save 20%. I'm not kidding. And they've got all the special special baby gifts, and they've got all the Cherokee scrubs and the shoes, all of this at the Child's World, 1308 Overland and Burley. And along with the Ambulatory Surgery Center, 1344 Highland Avenue in Burley. The number to call, and they can save you money on your outpatient surgeries, 677-8888. 677-8888. Ambulatory Surgery Center and A Child's World, bringing you school days in Cassia County. Boy, what a jam-packed morning we've had so far and still have a half an hour to go. Zeb at the ranch, and uh, we're going to take a little break and send it back over to Wheels at our main studio. We will be back in about three minutes. Don't you go away. And now back to Zeb at the ranch on AM 1230 KBAR. To reach Zeb, call 436-2244 or toll free 1-866-927-4587. And now, here is Zeb Bell. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. And as we roll into our last 30 minutes, I'd like to say Ag Express is looking for drivers. That's right. And all you have to do is just give them a call. They're looking for full and tart... <laughs> Try that again, Zeb. Don't trip over your tongue. Full and part-time positions, and they're looking for retired folks to apply. You can work two or three days a week, whatever works best for you. And you're home every night, too, using new and maintained equipment. They've got great vacation benefit programs. I'm telling you what, you better get a hold of them today. Ag Express, Dale and Paul at 438-8886. Allen and Twin Falls of 731-2495. And Russ and Burley at 431 Seven one seven five. Ag Express is looking for drivers. Ag Express is looking for you. Don't forget to Ramsey Heating and Electric and Lennox, and they're offering up to seventeen hundred dollars in rebates on qualifying new Lennox home comfort systems. All you have to do is call Ramsey Heating and Electric at six seven eight zero four five nine. Ramsey Heating and Electric and Lennox saving you money. Let's go to the phone line right now, and I believe it was about three, four months ago I had these folks on the program, and I wanted to talk more about what they're doing to help our veterans. And we have, with the honor, courage, and commitment, HCC Incorporated, Cliff Sossaman. Good morning, Cliff. How are you? I'm doing outstanding. Zeb, how are you doing? Now, correct me if I'm wrong. Is it uh, Sossaman or Sossaman? Correct me. Sossaman. You had it right. Oh, good. Now, you're a Marine Corps veteran and executive director of the HCC. Now, a lot of my audience is probably going honor, courage, and commitment. What does that mean, and what do you do? So, honor, courage, commitment, what it means is pretty much what it says. You know, it's the uh, the core values of the Marine Corps, and that's what we founded the organization on uh, when it was founded back in 2011. Um, and the idea is we help veterans become entrepreneurs. We help veterans regain their sense of purpose, uh, whether that's through, like we said, entrepreneurship or whether that is through uh, helping them uh, 
find that next career. Uh, we have a program where we teach veterans how to do an effective career search, not just find that next job. You know, all of this sounds really good, but it's not as easy as I'm sure you purport it to be. I mean, my goodness, when you started this, along with some of your uh, veterans uh, and partners in serving our military, uh, how did you come up with the concept? I mean, where did you fit all the cogs into the wheel? Well, the, the concept uh, was, was uh, brought brought to light by, by another Marine, not myself, uh, another Marine who served in, in Afghanistan, and when he got out of the Marine Corps, uh, he had a successful business. Uh, he had a web development company that he founded, and, and he looked around, and he, was, he saw a lot of the guys and, and gals that he served with were not as uh, successful as him and were, were not doing as well as he seemed to be doing, and he wanted to find out why. Why was that? Why was he doing better in some instances of life than others? And so through some education and things, he, he came to realize that he had a mentor that kept him on track. Uh, he was uh, constantly educating himself through formal and non-formal means. And he had um, uh, the, the opportunity, he was giving back in his community through community service projects, not just through veteran projects, but all sorts of projects. Uh, and being, helped him regain that sense of purpose by giving back in his community. And as he looked at that and he discovered these things, that's when he figured this is what those that are not doing as well in their transition, this is what they're lacking. So those are the three pillars that we like to say. That's the foundation that HCC was built on, community service, education, and mentorship. If anybody has, not just veterans, but anybody in life, has those things in, that they're working towards or that they have in their life, they are on a path towards success, on a path towards fulfillment. Uh, and that's what we're trying to, and that's what we do every day uh, here at HCC for veterans uh, in our community and, and those, uh, hopefully, in the near future around the country. Cliff, how big a problem, and I don't even know if I want to use the word problem, correct me, but how big an issue is it for our military to come back, maybe after serving uh, when they were 18, 19-year-olds, coming back to uh, our country, America, maybe as 21, 22, 23-year-olds, and trying to fit in, trying to find a niche? How big a problem is it? You know, for some, it's bigger. It's a bigger um, issue, we'll say, than it is for others. Um, and it really comes down to this: when we're in the military, uh, we we have a team around us. We have those individuals that we work with every day. We together, we play, play together, deploy together, train together. Everything we do together. And then when you get out of the military, when you leave service, you leave that network, you leave that community, and that leaves a big hole. Uh, in, in oneself to try to fulfill, right? And then the other part of that, on top of that, is that we have, uh, we are a part of something that's greater than ourselves. You put the uniform on to go defend the country, uh, you are part of a larger mission. Um, and then when you leave the military, you no longer have that greater sense of purpose. So that's what we're doing at HCC, helping them regain that sense of purpose so that they can then go back and be able to find the things in their community that will help them with their transition, that will help them. You know, you get up every day and you go to a job that you hate, and which I don't think you do, Zeb. I, I tend to believe by listening to your show that you tend to love what you do. I do. Is that correct? Absolutely. So for those individuals out there who do not love what they do, you get up in the morning and, and you know, you hear the old saying, right, somebody's got a case of the Mondays, right? You have the... Uh, that, that oh, I got to go to work again, and da 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 da. And you, you're at five o'clock. You're waiting for that whistle so you can jump in your car and get home as quickly as possible. That's not fulfilling your sense of purpose, and that's not giving your life meaning. Because at the end of the day, we spend most of our lives at work. And if you don't like the people you work with, and you don't like the job that you do, you pretty much have a miserable life. And guess who gets the brunt of that? Your wife. Yeah, absolutely. Your, husband, your kid. Your parents. Your family because you are just living a miserable life. So finding that sense of purpose, and, and, and for everybody it's something different, right? And finding that, that job that fills that hole, that, that helps you feel whole again, gives you that, fulfills your sense of why, that is, that's where the transition comes from, because veterans have that when they're in the military. I'd say a vast majority of us, when we're serving, this is what we're meant to do. This, we are serving and we are doing something and part of something greater than ourselves. 
When we get out, we no longer have that. And so it's getting those veterans to figure out what that is. And we have programs in which we do that. And that is what helps fill that that problem, right, and helps solve that issue that you were just talking about. You know, Cliff, how do they... And and maybe I'm not seeing something here, so help me. But uh, how do they, the veterans, know and find out about you and what you can do to possibly aid and assist them? I mean, what's the liaison there? What do you, how do you get the information out? So the first first and foremost is through our website, uh, www.hccvet.org. Hccvet.org. That's our website. That's our first. That's our first uh, iteration and our first uh, line of communication to everybody out there. Second is through social media. We have a, a very robust Facebook page that we're constantly growing. In fact, as of this morning, we were only eight people away from 26,000. So wow. I really appreciate it. Uh, we, we actually have our own radio show called the HCC Hour, and we put a challenge out today for the, the 26,000th like on our Facebook page. We will send them uh, one of our, one of our uh, HCC polo shirts so they can help us spread the message for what we're doing here in DFW. So I put that out to your fans as well and the people listening to your show. The 26,000 like will get a will get a nice new HCC shirt uh, from us. Um, so that's the other way we put it out. And then we do it through, through emailers and mailing lists. And we have a spot on our website where people can join our mailing list so that they can continue uh, to get monthly and frequent updates. We don't spam people. It's once a month at best just so they can stay up to breast, uh, abreast of what we're doing here at HCC. You know, I would imagine, Cliff, that you've got a lot of success stories of people that have been just wild-eyed with anticipation of trying to make a success of themselves after their military career, and share some of those stories, would you? Absolutely, and I'll start off with some statistics. Um since we, we launched uh, with our first class for our veteran entrepreneurship training in 2012, we've had 60 veterans go through our program. We've had 30 veterans that have uh, started a business or that we assisted their business in growing through that program. We've had six nonprofits that have been launched. And through those organizations, rough, just over $16 million in revenue has been created. Wow. Um, couple of stories. We've got one veteran who went to our program in 2015. She's an Air Force veteran, uh, and she is uh, an artist. Went to school for it and has a great knack for it. She has a piece that is now on solo display within the Pentagon called Letters of Sacrifice. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's, it's a reminder to everybody that the current wars are not over, and there is a letter for each um, individual who has been lost in combat since 9-11. Uh, we've got another veteran who was one of the first ones to go through our program, uh, went through our program, went to law school, and has started a law firm that was successful. He sold that law firm, started another law firm, and is doing just amazing um, in that as well. So, I mean, there's two quick ones right off the top of the right off the top of my head of, of veterans that are going out and just doing amazing things. Um, you may have heard of the. Uh, the initiative uh, 22 Kill, and last summer there was uh, the 22 Push-Up Challenge. Yes. Um, that was started within our organization as well. So we're, we've got people that are going out and, and doing amazing things in, in, in arts, in business, and then in the nonprofit world as well and creating great awareness for different issues uh, that are happening in our society today. Cliff, I haven't got a lot of time left, but I want to do uh, due diligence to what we're talking about here this morning. Can you kind of give us a real short, abbreviated thumbnail sketch of what the program is and what it entails? Absolutely. Well, we have three, but I'll break down the first one, and our, kind of our highlight is our, our VET program, Veteran Entrepreneur Training. It's a four-phase program that's based on the four, the four steps of the business life cycle. Uh, so the first phase of the program is based around your concept. You have an idea, but you don't know how to get started. The second one is on the formation of the business. We'll help you get the business, the foundation laid uh, with websites, uh, business plans, marketing plans, uh, and then business entity formation, all of those things you need to have. The third phase is based on um, the uh, growth of the business and, and really the validation of the business. And, and really understanding, does my product or my service work, and is this what people are looking for to buy? Uh, the fourth phase is really on the, the growth, 
uh, and that is based on scaling your business. Okay, we've done everything else. It's working, and now it's time to buy more trucks. It's time to buy more product. It's time to hire more people. It's time to get a bigger space. And that's what, and then potentially looking for whether it's a, a traditional loan, venture capital, angel, angel investments, uh, whatever that is. That's what that fourth phase is based on. Uh, and that's how we're, we're taking businesses all the way from, you know, an idea all the way through, um, major growth. Uh, and then the other program, like I said before, is our ACT program, the Advanced Career Training Program. Uh, and that is really, it's a one week program, five days. And we are teaching veterans how to do a and how to do a successful and a targeted job search, career search. How to then build a a resume based on a specific job description. How to network. How to dress. How to interview. We give them a free suit to another partner organization of ours called Seating Warriors. So these are the things that we're doing to help empower veterans. We don't give anybody anything. We're not about um, the the entitlement aspect. We don't want to hear it. We don't believe in it because as veterans, we were not entitled to anything. We were empowered. You didn't get through boot camp or through uh, officer training school uh, by people giving you stuff. You had to go out and work for it and earn it, and that's what we believe needs to happen today in our society, and that's what we are empowering veterans to go out and create great change in, in America today and grow this economy. You know what? Now, Cliff, bear with me on this thought. But I'm sitting here, and you've got me so interested in this project for another reason. Have you and your associates ever thought about developing a school program to maybe get these millennials off of their dead butts and get to work and appreciate capitalism in America? Well, we have not. But that is a very interesting concept, Deb, and one that we will definitely look at in the coming days, weeks, and months. I tell you what, it's so inspirational to think that we've got people like you and others that are out there and they're showing uh, people basically what's available, what you can do, what you can achieve, but it all goes back to personal responsibility and pride. That's what you're reinstilling in people. Well, that's that's what we get when we go into the military, right? I was a Marine for six years. When I when I stepped across that parade deck my last day at MCRD San Diego, and I was wearing my dress blues, and that commanding officer shouted out, let me be the first to, to say, good morning, Marines. You know, the pride that was instilled in us through that, the hard work that we had to do to do that, um, it, it's unmatched, right? And so now it's, it's about business, and, and I've had four small businesses, I've started three nonprofits, and the pride of seeing those, you know, your baby, right? That's what it is. When you yep. see something that you've put your blood, sweat, and tears into, and you something that you have worked so hard to see it come to fruition. And really, at the end of the day, it's not about the, it's not about the goal at the end, right, Zeb? It's about the journey That's and it. how we yep. grow. Yep. And we tell people all the time that are going through our programs, you have to get outside of your comfort zone because if you stay in your comfort zone, you're never going to grow as an individual. You're never going to grow a business. All you're going to do is sit on the couch and watch Oprah and eat bonbons all day. And that's not what America was built on. That's not what America is about. It's about going out there and creating change and doing epic things. And that's what we're doing uh, every day with our partner organizations, with our companies we're helping start. That's what drives us every day, me, myself. You know, Ursul, which we had on the show last time we were on, our director of operations. We've hired a couple other individuals. That's what makes us fired up every day. That's what, you know, we just, it's hard to explain, but it's empowering for us to be able to see growth in these other individuals, and we love it. Oh, my goodness. I can hear the enthusiasm and the passion for what you're doing in your voice, Cliff. I really appreciate it, and I respect you. But honestly, you and your group needs to consider going into the schools and getting our millennials and our younger people back to a work ethic of responsibility, and there are great opportunities out there. What you're doing for the veterans, I salute you, and it's called Honor, Courage, Commitment, HCC Incorporated, Cliff Sauce. God bless you, man, and thanks for coming on the program. Hey, Zeb, it was a pleasure to be here. It's always great to talk to you. I, I hopefully we can do it again soon, and, uh, and and I look forward to talking to your listeners again. You guys are great up there, and 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 where you're at up there in the Idaho area, I love it, love that part of the country. And uh, hopefully one of these days I'll get up there, and maybe we can talk face to face. I hope so, I hope sir. So, God, God bless you. Bless you. 
Thank you very, very much. Cliff Sossaman with the Honor, Courage, Commitment, HCC Incorporated. Boy, they're doing a lot to help our veterans come home and at home be successes. I love that. Oh. My, I guess if I'm going to continue my success, I better get a weather forecast on here. And the weather brought to you this hour by Scarrow's Meats. Mmm, delicious, delicious, the bratwurst and the the breakfast sausages and the buckboard bacon, leaner and more economical than traditional bacon and all kinds of different great flavors. Scarrow's Meats, 331 North Road, Jerome, number to call, 324-7657. Oh, and they've got a tax return meat package for two forty nine plus tax. Uh, about fifty seven pounds of beef, pork, and chicken. Check it out at Scarrow's Meats. Oh, it's great! They're changing the way we eat, one delicious bite at a time. Right now, here's Gina with the weather. Today it's going to be a little bit on the windy side, but as we make our way towards the weekend, it's going to feel a little bit like summer. Mostly sunny skies for today. Winds out of the west right around 18 miles an hour. We are expecting a high of 63. Tonight, low of 39. Tomorrow, mostly sunny skies. High of 71 with an overnight low of 42. Thursday, oh, Thursday is going to be nice. Sunny skies, high of 79. Overnight low of 50 for Friday, even better. Mostly sunny skies, high of 83 with an overnight low of 53. Then for Saturday, a few clouds will be rolling in. Partly cloudy skies, high of 76. That is your weather for Zeb at the Rain. Thank you, Gina. My, 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 my. It sounds like it's going to get better every day. I'm looking forward to it. I even, for the first time this morning on the studio, uh, in the studio, have opened the window a crack because we needed some fresh air. Oh, I love it. Weather forecast brought to you by Scarrow's Meats, 331 North Road, Jerome. The number to call, 324-7657. They are changing the way we eat one delicious bite at a time. It is really, really good. You know, I wasn't kidding when I told Cliff Sossaman a few minutes ago, what a program to instill in our younger people um, a feeling of, hey, this is a great country. Hey, there's a lot of opportunities out there. Hey, this is how you can start a business. Hey, here's what's open and available to everybody to be successful and not waste your life. Oh, my goodness. I can't wait to talk to him again. I really enjoyed that conversation. Um, Let's see what else have I got to remind you of. Tomorrow being Wednesday, and normally what I do is always give you a little review of who's going to be on the program the next day. Now, that's all well and good, and it's all a plan that should be fulfilled. However... At 7 o'clock this morning, I had three of tomorrow's five guests call me and say, we're going to have to reschedule. (laughs) We're going to be out of town. We're going to be on an airplane. We're going to be at a breakfast meeting in Washington, D.C. So as far as me telling you who's going to be on the program, the only one I know with any assurity that's going to be on the show tomorrow, Dave Beagle from Indianapolis. But I promise you, I promise you, I will do due diligence and make sure that everybody's taken care of and all the segments are provided for. Don't go away. Uh, don't forget, to your Magic Valley Les Schwab Tire Centers, all seven locations serving you and with the safest tires for your driving. Now, let's talk a little bit about your passenger cars. How about the Xeon RS3A? Woo! on sale it's on sale right now it's all season performance tire quality handling and it's on sale so you stop in and check it out for your passenger cars and ask about their free pre-trip safety check yep their free pre-trip safety check includes visual inspection of tires and wheel alignment front end components brake components the list goes on and on and on check it out at all seven locations of your magic valley les schwab tire centers with lane and rupert dave on blue lakes and twin mike and buell mike and jerome the twist family and paul daniel on pole line in twin falls and my buddy randy on overland in burley the best your magic valley les schwab tire centers. Real quick, don't forget if you're going to be sending out any cards today, uh, send a birthday card to Russell Smith. He's going to have his 92nd birthday this Saturday, and he's at the Idaho State Veterans Home, 
157 Alvin Ricken Drive, room 7070 in Pocatello, 83201. Please, three-time Purple Heart recipient for our great country, Russell Smith, with his 92nd birthday coming up on Saturday. That's going to be it for today. We're going to wrap it up and put it back in the box and be back here again tomorrow morning at 8.06. And we'll saddle the horse and ride for three hours right here on Zebeth Ranch. And we're on K-Bar, 1230 a.m. And then streaming live on the Internet all over the world on Zebbell.com. And don't forget, the way things were are the way things ought to be. God bless you and your family. We'll see you tomorrow morning at 8.06.